Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Random Heathen Ramblings podcast, where we discuss all sorts of things Germanic heathenry related. My name is Jesse. I am your host. Let's get into it. Well, 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 hello there. Hello to you. Oh, and to you over there. And to you in the back corner picking your nose. I see you. Hail and welcome back to another episode of the Random Heathen Ramblings podcast, folks. Good to have you back today. I've got a really, really fun episode lined up for you. So much fun, in fact, that my normal intro where I am in my tunic and I've got the banner behind me, you know, the whole normal setup. Um, this show was so awesome that I forgot to record the intro before we got the guest on the show. So that's why we've got the, the splash screen over here behind me with the Random Heat and Ramblings podcast banner. Um, but so yeah, we've got, uh, we've got a guest coming on today. This is going to be a fun one. I spent a lot of time talking with this gentleman today. And I hope you guys are going to enjoy it. It is a long one, so just a forewarning for you. You might want to um, get comfy, you know, um, or down this one for later and, and watch it in piecemeal. Whatever works best for you. I just want to let you know right off the rip um, that this was a longer one. So um, Benjamin Davison, Davidson, excuse me, or otherwise known as the Dream Wizard, uh, is joining me here today to talk about dreams and what stuff dreams are maybe made of and do our dreams mean anything and i thought this would be a really fun topic to dive into today because benjamin is not a pagan he's not heathen um he is really nothing i guess uh in the, in the sense of his religious views i believe you'll he'll you'll hear him describe himself as an atheist or uh atheistic views but really really cool guy uh, from the time that i got to spend chatting with him um, has a lot of years of uh, psychology study, so Freudian, Jungian uh, uh, concepts, and and we just we we talk about a whole bunch of things as you're going to hear uh, today on this episode, and um, it's very 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 possible that I will be a guest on his podcast called Dreamscapes. You're going to find all of his information down in the show notes or description. He has a website. Uh, which if you go to his website and go to his about section, you will find all of his social media, his his podcast information, his uh, YouTube channel, all of his socials. Everything's down there in his website about section. So it's an easy one stop sort of shop thing, kind of like how I have with the Linktree link, which, by the way, don't forget, check out the Linktree uh, link in the uh, description and show notes so you can find all the ways that you're able to support this podcast. Um, so we're not going to do a whole bunch of housekeeping stuff. You guys already know the drill. Please like, comment, share, subscribe, follow, upvote, you know, all the things. Just just be engaging, be a part of it. And let's get into this episode of the Random Heathen Randless Podcast. Do our dreams really mean anything? Do our dreams mean anything at all? Benjamin Davidson, the dream wizard himself, is going to explain. Let's get into it. Uh, yeah, I get it. <laughs> I like, uh, you remember oh, Fight Club. So one of my favorite yes. movies, actually one of the movies I think should be a, not mandatory, but it is on the top of the list of, of necessary, I believe, rites of passage for a young man. Consider these questions. Um, so one of my favorite things is he's doing the editing and the thing. And he's like, boop, here's the cigarette burn. He reaches up and touches the spot where it was going to be. That's how I think of it. Like if I had a card, it would be up in this corner here and I would go up to the right because that's where it is. I can't do the backwards thing. So anyway, Fight Club, highly recommended if you haven't seen it out there. Yeah, what's the number one rule, right? Right? Oh <laughs> shit! You know, that's a great the discussion. Number one rule. That's a great discussion too. So it's a movie about anarchists, and and I didn't get this until a decade after the movie came out. The number one rule is meant to show you that you're supposed to break the rules. How does Fight Club grow? It's it grows by people by word of mouth. How do you spread the word if you're not allowed to talk about it? Yeah. Uh, so like the rule was imposed for like you know. Uh, Trolls. It's a. It was a. It's a, the the energy of um the trickster. I mean, it's oh, that's a very trickster esque movie. The mm. trans transformation, crossing boundaries, uh, challenging status status quos. 
challenging the meta concept of rules by yeah. making a rule that is meant to be broken because that's what this club is about breaking mm. rules uh breaking societal norms we don't punch each other in the face yeah we do we do it for fun we do it voluntarily amongst ourselves uh you know and then there's a lot of other meta narratives in it as far as like the um what does it mean to be a man to be masculine why have we lost this competitive fighting spirit do you mm. need a reason to fight? I mean, just fight for fun because it is fun and you're not hurting anyone but each other by, you know, what's boxing match, that, that, that type of thing. Yeah. Um, you know, and character. Then, yeah. Yeah. Anyway, I could go on and on about that. This is not, this is not the review of Fight Club. <laughs> no, yeah, though. That's a, I never really thought of it like that. It's kind of a neat well, angle to, to I take. suppose that's a, um, one one thing you're going to learn or you are learning as you watch it happen, this is where my brain goes. I just, what made me think of that? Who knows? Uh, the muses whispered to me. We, the conversation took us there. But these are my expansive, associative, disorganized, nutty professor thoughts. And that's how the dream interpretation works for me. You mention something, we run with it. I get feedback. Um, and 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 uh, But it's that crazy explosion of, oh, there's so many directions to go. And then I try and name them all. And we get a resonance with something that makes sense mm -hmm. to you. Um, sometimes I get lucky. And the first one I name is like, oh, that's it. Or, uh, and I tell people also to cut me off anytime, please. You also, I, I will ramble. Um, but if I'm rambling in a dream interpretation, I say, you get a sudden inspired thought. It's like, whoa, that just made me think of X. Yeah. Stop me and say, I need to tell you this. And I will shut up for a minute and listen. Oh, that's what we're looking for. That's, 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 uh, so the answers kind of, are not in me. Yeah. It's kind of like an echo chamber and we're pinging things to see what comes back to us mm. in a way. Yeah. That's a great analogy. Echo location in the dark It yeah. is kind of the way it is. And so I'm, oh, yeah. I'm the, um, in a way, a tuning fork and I resonate at different frequencies and it's going to harmonize with something in you that makes sense feels right you're gonna get a zing like head to, mm. just in my last interpretation interview with a gal who's very much on the kind of um spiritual side of things we'll say fair enough but also a very practical level-headed uh, uh businesswoman um she and i got into the idea like when i feel like i'm in a flow state like things are working like i'm i'm on to something i get a visceral physical sensation as if a flow of energy coming through my head down into my chest area and coming out like a care bear and and nice. shooting that rainbow out and the anyway i don't know i don't know what more to say about that 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 was an epiphany to me yesterday of like that mm. yeah that's when it hits it hits that. yeah 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 and she says you're channeling the the god or source energy and i'm like i want to believe i am uh you know i want to believe i'm uh you know on the side of the angels as they as they say mm. uh even though i'm not a um explicitly a christian so this is a uh pagan-ish podcast or at least not explicitly mm. uh, christian neither am i i'm very much you know agnostic atheist uh but i have a yeah. great appreciation for religious traditions i don't think they came from nowhere i don't think they were pulled out of somebody's butt and imposed upon us i think every mythology has a reason for existing it's trying to explain something about the world and i would also say that about the christian mythology without trying yeah. to insult any christians i think it has a i think the bible is a tremendous kind of how-to practical best practice guide for a lot mm. of things i wouldn't um but then again, I, I'm not a person who says, you know, there is literally a God that has these specific attributes and Jesus right. Christ li literally came to earth. I, I almost think like, uh, it's like Gandalf. It doesn't matter if Jesus, Jesus Christ ever lived. He's a, at least a literary figure of value showing sure. a way of life that has some merit. Of virtue in its favor. Yeah. 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 Anyway, long story. Yeah. Short. <laughs> no, I think that's great. And I think that that's a, that's a, you know, let's get into it, right? Let's get mm -hmm. into the to the podcast. So, I mean, I am joined here today with a dream wizard of all things who I never thought I would have discovered or encountered <laughs> in my perusings on the internet. So we have Ben or Benjamin Davidson, uh, also known as the dream wizard. Welcome to the show, Ben. Thank you very much. It's good to be here. It's great to have you. And the reason why I thought it would be great to have you on here today, uh, just from what we've been talking about now uh, for, I don't know, the last 10 or 15 minutes is <laughs> right is you've got a lot of of things to say about a lot of things but we're going to try to we're going to try Absolutely. to focus a bit on like the dream um aspect of it so before we get into like all of the fun stuff i would like to mm -hmm. give you an opportunity to share with my viewers and listeners a little bit about yourself or much about yourself as you want to share what is this dream wizard what, what are we talking about here what are you doing as a dream wizard yeah, definitely. Um, well, first I'll say, hi, I'm Benjamin, the dream wizard Davidson, you know, um, 
I have a background in psychology. I, I did uh, inpatient emergency psychiatric, um, you know, uh, for 20 years. So I've seen when, when people say they've seen it all, I've pretty much seen it all. Might be a few things uh, outside my wheelhouse, but uh, very few. So I took, I take all that experience and I bring it to the, uh, the idea of dreams and, and, you know, analyzing dreams has a long history in psychology. And before that, I think people were practicing psychology before it got that name uh, and it fell under religion and different tribal structures, medicine men, shamans and stuff have had this mm-hmm. kind of community cohesion, personal um, balance and, and good health type of um, type of approach to things. So, I mean, that's kind of long story short about my journey to getting here about three or so years ago, I decided I didn't want to be a mental health prison guard anymore because this was a locked facility of people with, you know, acute psychosis and bipolar and, you know, paranoid schizophrenia and different stuff. And they needed to be kept safe for their own good. And so that, but I've always had a, uh, had a problem with being the guy who has to stand at the door saying, I'm sorry, you can't leave. And they're desperate to get out. And I, I can't allow that because reasons, you know, employment yeah. partly. And, you know, I, it's, that's a tough one for me. Safety too. I, for themselves and others. I mean, I've worked in corrections mm. and I've seen what it's like when you're dealing with people who are confined and, yeah. and, and locked up and, you know, the, the prison system is, is it, I mean, that's a whole other conversation too. It's, it's a messed up. The judicial system as a whole is yeah. messed up and, and mental health care. Um, I don't think is, is where we need to be with it these days, but no. It's- yeah. And it's funny to think, I mean, so I get into part of my road currently, and this is all tangent, bam, explosion of thoughts. This is what happens to me. I, I am doing my own masterclass in how to interpret dreams by reading. So these are not all the same book, a stack of all the same books. This is, this is book 16. This is all the other 15 books. This is just my current list of reproductions of historical dream literature that I am reading, editing, putting into a new format, adding footnotes, really making it uh, uh, an enhanced edition from the modern age, giving my own, um, framing and opening um, editor's note about what the content is and, and how it's going to, um, to to relate to the to the, to the broader topic. Um, I'm working on book 17. I've got at least six more planned. And then I've got a wow. whole series of books I want to write called A Wizard's Guide. And I'm starting with A Wizard's Guide to Aesop's Fables. And it'll be the psychological principles that we know today, proven scientifically, that they knew 2000 years ago and put it in this story to tell children to help them cope with the world, understand human nature, that kind of stuff. Okay. Long story short on that, we're talking about the prison system and the the medical system as well. There's an entire history to that as well. Just like I'm researching dreams. There's a reason we got to where we are today. People had a problem. They made decisions. Those decisions compounded for good or ill. And now we've got really messed up, complicated things that are all just a kind of like a thrown together jigsaw of, of ad hoc solutions that are not always the best you know this reimagining mm-hmm. things would go a long way i think long story short that's, that's yeah you just you just saw what happens when i'm interviewing people about their dreams that's how i that's how i roll <laughs> yeah that's how it goes so you've got in front of you you said you've got 16 different books mm-hmm. and you're working on a lot about a half dozen or you have you're working on a 17th you've got a, about yeah. a half dozen more planned are these are these um works of of study for others too like it, could they be considered study work for the for for people maybe interested in pursuing what what would you call what is this called we talked about this offline a bit what's the name of of interpreting dreams it's a oh yeah yeah okay so dream interpretation is ancient it goes back since before recorded history um the greeks had you know morpheus god of dreams and the sandman is a popular series now on netflix and that was based on a comic book from the 90s but you know the greeks so the greeks had morpheus which was um actually a son of the god of night nix and then morpheus had a son oneros and he brought a specific kind of dream to mankind the greeks had a wonderful way of describing the world as external forces that act upon humans. Uh, So they've had a very conceptual framework for that. Well, uh, the art of interpreting dreams was, you know, named after the the god Oneros, and it became known as Oneromancy, uh, the the magic of understanding dreams. And that's actually uh, what I call this series of books is Augury, Bibliomancy, and Chaos, uh, the ABCs of dream interpretation, because I like clever things like that. So what is Augury? omens uh signs symbols uh bibliomancy books uh bibliomancy is is specifically 
attributed to flipping the Bible specifically open to a random page and closing your eyes and pointing to something. And that's supposed to be God speaking to you. So that's the technical term. But I think any study of books for understanding is the magic of, of literature. Uh, the, the mm. It is bibliomancy. It is the magic of studying books. Um, and then chaos is, you never know what's going to happen. I mean, the world's chaos. Your, your, your dreams are certainly feel chaotic until we bring some light and understanding to them. Did you have a question? And I'm not answering <laughs> No, yeah, the, no, I named the God of dreams. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> well, I meant it is like with with everything that you're doing. I mean, you've got a small I wouldn't say small, but I mean, you got you got quite an impressive array of, of books, which I would uh, venture to say are for sale. Are these all for yes. sale? Yeah, yes. And and I and I try to be very clear with people that there uh, these are historical dream literature. So I take mm. books that are out of print and available through university web pages. And you honestly, if you look at the title and the author, you can go find these on, um, what is it? Archive.org. I, I found them there literally myself. I've gone to say university of Michigan website and they have a digitized copy of a book that's out of print. And I just take it and make it my own. And these are actually heavily edited. So if you look at the original version and, and uh, book two is, is a great example. So Book two is called The Mystery of Dreams. It is an explicitly Christian perspective on dreams. So I look at the Muslim perspective, the Greek perspective, the Egyptian perspective. I take all of these into account. Um, so what do you what will you find online if you look for The Mystery of Dreams? Well, it was originally just the documented written out sermon of a 1600s preacher. And so I took that and put it into book form, including translating a lot of the Latin badly, probably Latin scholars out there. Feel free to critique. Uh, but it is not simply copy paste. It is not a digital scan of a PDF that I just put into a book. A lot of, there's a lot of cheap stuff out there, but I put that extra layer of work into these to truly make them a unique product that have value from for, as what they are. None of these represent exactly what I believe, but all of them together informs what I do. And so I literally, I think if you bought all of these books and read all of them, you would have apart from the 20 years in psychology, you would have a pretty good understanding of where I'm coming from with what are, what does it mean to sleep? What is sleep for? What is the experience of sleeping? Why does our brain work this way in sleep? What can we get out of it when we wake up and look back on that experience? If we have a memory of it. Um, I had a quick question too, yeah, yeah. from, from your studies and, and, and as extensive as they've been, I, I remember hearing so, at some point in my life that humans dream every night that they're they, they they go into that REM state right when they've or or at some point in time like we dream every night but it's just at what point it happens that our or how detailed it is or something happens where yes. we retain it is that true yeah yeah absolutely it's been a philosophical question throughout the ages do we dream every night and th that a lot of it gets down to what so i listen to another podcast i, I love these guys sitch and adams shout out to uh, the sitch and adams show they have what's called Sitch's law, which is when you're debating someone or having a discussion, there's always a lot of disagreements come down to definitions. It's like, well, that's not what I mean by that word. So, okay, well, we want to nail down what is a dream. So there, my perspective is that what we think of as dreams per se is the waking memory of a nocturnal vision in that sense, a, a nocturnal experience of thought in, in, in visual auditory terms. And then that's what we say is a dream when we wake up only if we can remember it. Now, that being said, my, my understanding of, of biology and my philosophical perspective, both align in the sense that, you know, what I say is the lungs breathe, the heart beats and the brain thinks, and it does that even while you were asleep, these things never stop. So technically slipping into unconsciousness, uh, the unconsciousness of sleep is an experience of losing conscious attention to the world and having it restricted just to your internal subconscious experience, which is always going on in the background when we're awake as well. So gotcha. what, what, I've, what I've come around to saying is that dreams are more like what our raw thoughts are it's more the experience of raw thoughts as they happen without the extra layer of processing them through conscious attention. So it's, it's almost like what you're seeing is, is more of your own raw, unfiltered, random associative or not random, but associative thought process, train of thought, free flow of consciousness as uh, without the imposing your will upon it. It's like, uh, you know, you're, when you're awake, you're in a rowboat. And when you're asleep, you're in the water being carried along with it. You're just drifting along. drifting along with it. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. 
Um, I hope that answers your question. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, yeah. That and it's a great, great in depth uh, description of it. And yeah. yeah, absolutely. So, yeah, I think so. Just to kind of give you like some background as we're talking. You know, I am a am a Norse pagan. You know, so mm. we have a, a pretty specific view of the world. Not not all pagans have the same world views on things. But but interestingly enough, in some of this uh, the mythology and some of the lore, uh, there's one particular. I don't know if you've ever heard of it, but there's one particular story that talks about a dream that one of the Norse gods have about mm. um, his own, or about about like a like destruction, his own destruction. But his name was Balder, and oh, uh, yeah, he has a, it's Balder's Draumer is is the name of the poem, and it. You know, Balder eventually is a uh, a figure in the mythology who is killed um, through mischievous ways, and his death is the thing that, in the mythology, incites the the twilight of the gods, Ragnarok, right? Their mm -hmm. their ultimate destruction. And um, but but was but what's interesting is like you never really, you know there there's like certain things about that dream if you look it up that you know he sees certain things but the the dream is seen by the gods as this prophecy and so mm -hmm. a like multiple attempts to protect balder from being killed to stop this inevitable thing from happening you know um he is he is his mother goes around all corners of the world to get oaths sworn from every living thing that they will never harm him because mm -hmm. she doesn't want harm to come upon him because if that happens if he risks being killed and the whole Ragnarok thing happens right so um that uh th those efforts to stop this dream from becoming reality uh is 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 one of the stories in the mythology and have you have you yourself encountered people or 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 seen things in other literature that carry the same kind of theme you know, dreams that get seen as prophecies of, of, of a future thing, really? Oh, yeah, yeah, no, for sure. So, um, oh, wow, so many, so many ways. Okay, number one, I want to say this before I forget it. My forthcoming series, A Wizard's Guide to X, Y, or Z, I actually want to open it up to other authors and have me be the editor and publish them. So I want to throw this out to you as someone who is a Norse pagan and understands these stories. If you, for example, but this is an actual offer as well, if you wanted to write A Wizard's Guide to Norse, paganism or Norse mythology or whatever, however you would phrase it. And the, the purpose of it would be to say, here are the stories. Here is actually what they mean and why these people, wh how they develop to explain the world and how it informs your viewpoint and your idea of right and wrong and good, good, uh, virtuous goals and behavior. Uh, I want to, I, I made this offer to another guy I interviewed uh, recently, um, a math teacher, and it would be a wizard's guide to basic math. And it would hmm. just, you know, because it's like his teaching style is more aligned with mine in some ways in terms of like, um, what am I trying to say? It would be teaching by example in a written form. Like here's simple stuff. Here's, let's say you want to build a fence. Here's all the math and geometry that goes into building a fence, measuring the, measuring the posts, how much volume of the concrete do I need? It's practical applications. They don't really teach school that way. So that's more of a wizard's approach is this practical hands-on. Can we make use of it? Yeah. And this goes into the whole, what, what is a wizard type? But we'll get into that too. So that was a whole tangent, but I wanted to throw that out as, a, as an actual serious offer. If, if you ever considered writing that kind of book, we can okay. work together and collaborate. It could go over, you know, two years, but I'm, uh, I'm getting quite good at editing and, and enhancing. And so I think I could uh, do that if you've ever considered. And then we, pu sure. you know, publish it under my, uh, my series, uh, um, and see, see where it takes us, but no pressure. Cool. I don't need an answer right now. Sleep on it. I say, um, Will so do. now I, okay, part of being a wizard as well means you got to be familiar with a lot of different stories. And I would not ever assert that I am an expert on Norse mythology from that, uh, it, but I have to be familiar with it. And I actually do know the story of Balder. And I believe it was, um, if I have it correctly, was it the mistletoe? The only mm -hmm. tree she could not um get get that or failed to get a commitment from or forgot there's different stories to tell it differently as far as i know um and yeah, then it, it was go ahead the uh it was it was the fact that at least in the stories it's it's that the mistletoe was too young to swear an oath mm. so frig was like oh you'll be all right you're just a baby you know we don't need your oath it, you're too young so yeah yeah in some ways the um 
a hubristic mistake of not taking a uh, potential risk seriously. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, and then the idea also there's, so we get, okay. And long story short on that is then Loki gets involved as well. And he's a, some people say he's jealous or it's just an innate mischief, mischievousness, different stories tell it differently, but he gets, contrives to set up this, what is it? A shooting contest. And they're all going to, they're going to, for sport, they're all going to take advantage of, of Baldur's invulnerability. Look, nothing can kill him. Ha ha ha. We're yeah. just having a great time. Right. That is also the hubris of we're not being cautious enough. We're, we're a little overconfident in our, we're taking risks we don't need to, and it mm-hmm. leads to catastrophe. So the meta narrative of these stories is like, here's the consequences of actions and why they go wrong. And let this inform your worldview. So I do need to be familiar with those stories. And you probably, long story short, would probably tell the story better than I do. But this is where my head goes to the meta narrative. Yeah. Stuff. And I also had a point there too. Oh, so the, yeah, so they craft, uh, was it Loki sneaks in an arrow made of um, mistletoe, uh, mistletoe and, uh, and it mortally wounds Balder. And he's the most beloved of all the gods and they're broken hearted about it. Um, yeah. And those, it's those kind of narratives and why they happen and, and the, the message of them is what makes them mm. important. Uh, yeah. Okay. And that goes to dream. Okay. <laughs> Two tangents. I can't believe I remembered. We're just tangent and all of it along here, okay. you know, hey, ramble, people, ta- ramble and tangents. Yeah. As long as people <laughs> find it entertaining, we're doing a good job. Um, yeah. <laughs> have I come across dreams represented or considered as prophetic? Absolutely. That's part of the broader study. And now my perspective, I, my lane is, scientific material philosophical and and psychology that is how i understand dreams and am able to help facilitate like a midwife help facilitate the birth of an understanding of of those dreams so i split it a bit of a a yin yang dichotomy i split out the supernatural not because i don't believe in it but because I don't understand it. And this is me choosing to stay in my lane. If you bring to me a dream and you say, is this purely psychological or is this a prophecy? I can't tell the difference. I can't identify one from the other. I cannot reliably say that dream is definitely a prophecy. If I could do that, and maybe I will someday, but if I could do that, I would, but I can't. So, and this, this is a grand tradition of dreams being prophetic and it goes back to biblical stories and before, uh, long before that, um, and I only reference that as a time period because I think a lot of the Norse Norse mythology is older even than the Bible. And there's you know Babylonian stuff that goes and there's stuff that goes back twelve thousand mm-hmm. to twenty five thousand years. Um, we get a lot of clay tablets that have surfaced that show you know civilization is older than we thought and uh, yep. um, all that kind of stuff. I was going somewhere with that. Oh, so if you read all these books, you will see many, many, almost all of these authors discussing that very question and bringing their own un- unique perspective to it, collating the opinions of prior uh, authorities on the subject and then opining themselves as a new authority, kind of like I am pretending to be or <laughs> hope, hope to become someday. Yeah, putting your, um, t- your twist on it, your angle on it. Yeah. Your, your yeah, flavor. Here, yeah. Based on the history and what I've read and what I understand, here's what I think is most likely. That's kind of where, I, where I'm coming from with most of this stuff, allowing for the possibility, hey, I could be completely wrong. Uh, I don't think so. Otherwise, I'd say something else. <laughs> yeah, you wouldn't put your you wouldn't put our, you know, and that's a lot of too. what um, not necessarily with dreams itself, but a lot of with this practice of of paganism or, or whatever, you know, a lot yeah. of people like to um, take a historical approach to it and see, you know, how was it done? at such and such a time what do we know about things that were done at such and such a time you know those hints those those pieces of of fact you know and use it to in a way like reconstruct um what was done then into into a modern application different you know purpose i guess behind it because we're talking about religiosity and in the actual doing of things Mm -hmm. um Whereas, you know, yours, I think your wheelhouse is more around like the the psyche and, and what's going on behind the scenes and, you yeah. know, um, but it is, what, it's, it's a, sorry, go ahead. Well, I was just going to say, but brought to mind a very interesting, it is accepted as a working theory, as an almost incontrovertible working theory that such a thing as the subconscious exists. This was not always an accepted fact. There was a huge controversy going back 100, 150 years ago about how to describe the internal experience and what it is. And there's a lot of people who said, um, 
oh, this thing you call the subconscious, what a bunch of hokum and hooey and spiritualism and nonsense. And now we kind of just take it for granted, like, okay, there's a subconscious and this is how it works. And does it? I mean, it's kind of a word, it's a working theory and it seems to make sense. Can we get results out of it? It seems like we can. So I think that's a practical proof is in the pudding type of thing. Yeah. Um, that's my tang tangential thought. So That's a wild, you said even as early, I mean, relatively speaking, yeah, 100 to 150 years ago, we as a civilization were like, subconscious bleh, that doesn't yeah. exist that's not a thing that's crazy that we're yeah. this so closely detached like coming into this idea that we're we're actually more than what we see when we're awake you know physically yeah. awake or conscious there's there's a lot that goes on behind the scenes you know have you ever watched that um netflix show lock and key or the i think it's lock and key or, or lock. yes you yes, know what i'm talking about one. kind of disappointing it just ended wow we, so my wife and i we just like finished the the last episode of the final season um last night actually and oh, wow. have you have you watched it all yet yes yes i did watch the whole thing my recall is not i get swiss cheese brain as far as memory goes sometimes which is amazing because i can ramble but i just I, but the, I fall in whatever hole i fall in and the <laughs> mind key or the or the or the head key that yes. they called it where yes. you can go and 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 the things that the the way that the production not to be like you know spoiler alert for people like if you guys have are knowing what we're talking about and you and you've watched the series and you haven't reached the end of it yet click off the video so you don't um get any spoiler alerts but fair warning to, yep. to, yeah to see how they like they set up stages they set up tv screens they they like put what i you know could could best say is is like the physical idea of what's really happening when we're asleep or when we're unconscious you know the the various yeah. plays things that are playing out um because, I mean, we've all had those types of dreams where it changes from scene to scene. You know, you walk into a room, next thing you know, you're in somebody else's house. You open a door, next thing you know, you're in the woods. You turn around, there's the ocean. Like, yeah. what is even going on with this <laughs> stuff, sure. you know? Like, the randomness of it all can be yeah. so hard well, to make sense of. And well, that's one of the things that, that makes me, so, so I just had a thought of like, how do I explain why I believe the subconscious is a real thing? So one of the proofs i think and that's why it has been accepted is that we can have the experience of not thinking something a piece of information and then go oh my camera just froze it sure did uh let me see if i stop the video and restart it ah two seconds here you're good filibuster the t the, the wonders of modern technology <laughs> i just unplugged and replugged it in ah uh, that didn't work oh is it working Yep, hey, we're I'm back. back. Oh, Jesus, I've had the worst luck with this camera. It's a Logitech video camera, and it just gets lost. It, my computer just says, you don't have a camera anymore. But, I, I think I do. What's going on here? What happened here? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. We're, we're good, okay, though. Long story short on that is, so we have the experience of being able to, say, retrieve a memory. That itself shows there is something outside of our conscious present attention which exists to draw from and that kind of repository of memory of things that are not actively in our conscious at the moment but which can be brought back into consciousness that seems to prove that well that area of long-term memory the storage seems to be the subconscious that's my understanding of it. and i think that it appears to be a real thing um even if it is um real in the sense of it we can only watch it function if you know what I mean, like we can't dissect the brain and say, here is the subconscious. It is this nugget. Uh, even, yeah. it's, it seems to be kind of everywhere. And it seems to be a manifest. Uh, um, uh, this is a word for it, like an emergent property in a way of of the way the brain works, um, which is just a whole amazing concept by itself. Um, we were going somewhere with that. It was something you said made me think of it, like a, the controversy over the does it or doesn't it exist and how recent it was yeah yeah just how you know again within the last less than 200 years we we had less or no concept of this you know and and, and yeah. then the function of it and uh you know i've i've um been approached by by people that had dreams and and they come to you know it's inevitable you know you do something for a long enough period of time newcomers to the to the to the scene or to that circle look to you as as someone with tenure that can mm. maybe gu help guide them on their way yes. you know and i've had people over the years just ask me hey i had this dream what does it mean and i'm like i'm not the one man <laughs> like, Send I, don't, my way. I, I don't yeah. know I, yeah like i have a i have somebody i can maybe uh defer them to now but i'm uh, and i definitely will because um 
you know, and, but, but hearing like other, like, and, and that was the thing I was going to say is, you know, you have, you have one person that asks what their dream meant and they, and they get as descriptive as they can based off of the memories that they've been able to retain from that experience, you know, and, and then people will chime in and they'll say their parts. Everybody says a little, something a little bit different, you know, and that's what I was, you know, kind of the, 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 the title or the name of the podcast, do our dreams really mean anything? Like, do they have a yeah. meaning you think? Yeah. Well, or is it just uh, random stuff that could be interpreted different by different people? So here, here's the, the full answer is yes and no, but, but we're going to, we're going to get into that. Of course. Um, there is a, also a long history of viewing dreams as nonsense, viewing dreams as random. So what you go back to the medieval times and there's a, a, a very, uh, we we get into the concepts of you know mistaken biological concepts that were the 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 medicine of the day. They think of the humors of the body. They talk about pe people being sanguine or phlegmatic and whatnot, or or, or bilious mm. bile, and they thought dreams came from gases coming up from the stomach and floating into your brain, and that causes these images. Now that was their understanding at the time. You go back to say biblical times, and it was like well they and even Greek times, and they you know, antiquity, 2000 years ago, they parsed it out as, well, there are different kinds of dreams. And that's where you, we, we get into the Greek understanding of like, well, what dreams are brought by Oniros? What dreams are brought by Isolos? And what dreams are brought by the, the guy that brings nightmares? I can't remember all the Greek gods. I'm going to write a book, a Wizard's Guide to the Greek Gods as well someday, because I need to get it straight in my head as well. Um, I have so many books planned. I, I never, Exciting. I'm not going to, yeah. I'm not going to finish them all before I die. It's true. It's like, <laughs> give me another 40 years. I'm not going to finish them all. That's fine. It'll, it's something to do. Keep me busy. Um, yeah. Okay. So oh, it, there are even people still today who say dreams are dreams mean nothing. They are entirely random. You cannot draw meaning from them. And I disagree. Of course, I wouldn't be in the, in this profession, so to speak, if I didn't think there was something valuable, but then when we get into, um, okay, there's the dichotomy. They mean nothing. They mean something. Okay. Let's say throw that aside. Now we're in the category of they mean something. Okay. What do they mean now? What rubric do you bring to it? What framework of understanding or analysis can yield something beneficial? And so, um, my approach, and that's almost all I can really speak to. Oh, oh and, um, shit, help me remember to talk about what it would be like to be a guest as a dreamer on my show. I want to come back around to that, but, sure. but just, just that idea. Cause I'm going to lose it. I'm going to lose that in this train of thought. Um, my personal understanding from my research and my psychology background, all of this leading it. And the idea that I set aside the spooky woo, not, in, not an insulting term. I think spooky woo is fascinating. I just don't understand it well enough to be an authority. Um, I think because the brain continually thinks while you're asleep, there are different levels of say depth of sleep and I'm, I'm working on this a kind of a work at theoretical work in progress, but you have to be close enough to waking close enough to conscious attention that you can attend to and have a memory of, yeah. of uh, some kind of experience. And if you sleep deep enough, the experience is still happening. It's just not close enough to conscious attention to grasp any of it. It's been smoke. It's, it's the man. I hate that too. Like when you wake yeah. up, you're like, that was so vivid. And then it just literally, as you're yeah. coming into consciousness, it like vapes away. It just wafts away. You're like, no, 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 no. But yeah. what, you can't yeah. remember the specific detail that when you first woke up, you're like, man, I could replay this. Oh no, wait, no, I can't. <laughs> yeah. Like, I hate and there, there is something about our conscious attention to the present environment overwhelming us to, to where those, those dream images disappear. That's a very <laughs> common experience. Um, I, I have a personal theory again, that dreams self select for importance, the dreams you can and do remember it's because you need to, there's something mm. in there that is so important that your brain won't let it go. And even more important, if you have a strong emotional response after waking up from it, it's on your mind throughout the day, something stuck with you strong enough to say, this is meaningful to you. This is something you need to understand and you can ignore it and your life is not over. You can let it go. It, but if you do, you're, I think you're missing an opportunity for something that might help you. So again, I'm trying to explain my, um, my approach. Uh, yeah, where was I going with all this? If you have a dream you remember, and if it has that emotional impact and it, it kind of demands understanding, I, what is this? Why does this bother me? Why is this still on my mind? There's something in there. So 
because we're thinking all night long, our bread, the wheels never stop spinning. Some of these, we're, we're, as humans, we're always kind of trying to problem solve. We, we want yeah. to understand and see ourselves more clearly and see our, see the world around us more clearly, but mostly like, like fear and anxiety serve a purpose. These dream experiences that we remember and have emotional impact seem to serve the purpose of focusing our attention on some unique understanding or problem that is potentially beneficial in either in avoiding a bad outcome or in obtaining a good outcome either way. Uh, so nightmares can be especially necessary to address, but also some dreams that are like, I didn't want to wake up from it. There was something magical about that place that made me want to live there. And I'm like, maybe there's something in your life that if you understood it, you would have a more magical experience of life. It, you would, you would yeah. obtain some benefit that is meaningful to you. And here's this dream trying to show you an understanding of it. So long story short, in my opinion, yes, dreams have, can have very in, intensely meaningful and, and personal uh, meaning. So yeah, long story here's a, short. here's a, here's a, here's a question for you. Yeah. I've been dying to ask somebody who's, you know, I'm glad I, I, I discovered you because this is a question that I've been wondering for a long time. And if you can make any sense of it, what about those times where you dream in your dreams? Mm. Like you're Lucid thinking, dream. yeah, you think that you're having this amazing experience. And then at some point in time, you're like, no, nah, I'm just dreaming. And you wake mm -hmm. yourself up out of that experience of that dream, but you're still in a dream state. Like you're not awake. <laughs> yeah. Dream within a dream. That's uh, it's in these books too. Yeah. That's like, so I've always known that was a concept, but then what have, what have people said about it? What, how do they understand it? My personal kind of collated understanding is that I don't know that you can fall asleep twice. I, I don't think the subconscious sleeps in that way. I don't think that's a physical experience we can have. So when you have the experience of waking up from a dream, it is a reference to that experience of waking up from a dream, if that makes sense. So it's not actually a double awakening. Mm -hmm. It's more like you are thinking about dreaming itself. You are thinking about what wow. would it be like if I woke up from a dream to so and and often the idea of awakening and this is where my brain explodes here's the uh, the the brainstorm thought bubble with all the little t spokes on the wheel what does it mean to awaken what does it mean to to yeah. um you know to come so we could say come to an understanding it, it to to shed the blinders keeping you from under it, it is it is to go from a state of unconsciousness to conscious attention so there's all these kind of associative things around it so if you have a dream that specifically says I was asleep and I woke up. This is your dream experience. So I, what I, where I would go with my interpretation thing is to say, okay, the framework of the dream appears to be saying, first, I become aware. Then other things happen. And the other things that happen is, okay, what are you becoming aware of? And what does your hypothetical fantasizing imagination think about how you would handle becoming aware of say a specific thing. So mm -hmm. for a lot of people, the icon of becoming aware or, or focusing attention is represented by the imagery of awakening. And so I, I don't think there's actually dreams within dreams necessarily, not, not as a thing, as a conceptual yeah. thing. Yes, but not as an actual, like thing. it feels that way. It's just not really yeah. what it, it is actual. Yeah. And yeah. then there are some dreams. I know I've had dreams before that are way more vivid than others to the point mm -hmm. where you didn't even realize that you were in the dream state. Um, yeah. How do we explain that? How do we like what's going on? Or, or can you even explain like what's going on that makes those dreams feel so real? Yeah, well, that's a great question. Can I explain it? Yes and no. <laughs> I don't know what the hell I'm talking about half the time. But okay, welcome gonna, to the I'm, show, folks. That's what you have when you get a dream this, wizard. It's, this it's, is what it's we do. The yes. dichotomy, the yes and the no. <laughs> yes, but also no. And both you know? things are true at the same time. So <laughs> yeah. I think there's, a, and again, another dichotomy. I think there's two ways of understanding the idea of a vivid dream and where they come from and why they happen. Um, one is the purely, in a sense, we might say biological, psychological side of things, which the dream was more intensely vivid because it was closer to your conscious attention. You were at a higher, say, level of sleep rather than a deeper level of sleep. So the impression left at that level of, of subconsciousness is going to be stronger. You're going to have more intense recall of the experience. And that's kind of the biological side. The other side of it is that um, 
it's possible that you retain it and the vividness of it is part of the dream experience because it's an intensely personal subject like or meaningful to you personally so the intensity of the vividness is a in a way its own kind of dream communication of this is something you think is important and should be addressed uh it's a very interesting thing we all often talk about dream visions but there's you get all five senses in dreams now it's as visual people we are most likely to have visual dreams our, our main form of interacting with the world is is vision and touch uh and those those are pretty high up on there and also sound um but you, you, you dream, uh, blind people dream they report you know hey you were asleep did you experience anything yes i did they don't dream in visions they don't see they have no concept of sight so they dream in touches and sounds those are the experiences wow. they have yeah 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 so we this is why we know it's actually kind of a real phenomenon and not random it's actually tied to our physical waking experience in in a lot of ways um I was going somewhere with that what was the original question Shit. uh the uh the 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 vividness of dreams why we yes. retain them so so much and, and others not so much yeah, yeah yeah exactly so um we have the five senses in dreams but we also have emotional experiences in dreams now yeah. an emotion is a completely internal experience regardless there is an external world that we interact with through our senses touch and vision but our internal emotional experience is completely <clears throat> imaginary it, now not that it imaginary like oh it doesn't exist it is a state of of a state of being that we experience but it only exists internally there's no physical manifestation of uh, of love or hate or anger or worry. They, they don't exist external to us. They are only a function of our mind. And we can also have those states of mind represented in dreams. If you, the classic example is nightmares, you're terrified. That's what makes it a nightmare. I'm scared. I'm, uh, I'm hunted. I'm trapped. All of these negative experiences. There's an emotional experience that can exist in our dreams every bit as much as the experience of seeing something happen before us. That brings me to one, one other thing, just to uh, uh, kind of bookend this uh, or comprehensively address it. If you, if I ask you, um, okay, you're in this dream experience, what is the motivation of that other person? And you tell me, oh, they were there to hurt me. How do you know that? Did they say something? No, I just kind of knew it. That is as real as seeing the person or hearing them make a threat. The mm -hmm. sometimes dreams just come specific images or experiences come with an innate knowing because that's it's equally as real as seeing an action performed, having an understanding that person's here to kill me. They've never made a threat. They're just walking towards you. Walking is a neutral behavior. Are they coming mm -hmm. to hand you some flowers? No, they're coming to kill me. And you just know it. And that is that is a dream truth in a way. The mind says, okay, here's the scenario. It's like a thought experiment. What if that person's coming to kill me? Go, scene, you know? Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's almost like, um, I wonder if in a way, you know, the things that we uh, have in the, in, like when we're awake, you know, when we're not in a sleep state or in a dream state, um, those subconscious feelings that we have are like brought to life in the dream world in the dream state to almost act as a warning or as like yes. a, as like a you know hey what you're feeling there's some validity to it let's play it out for you to actually see it but definitely. not do it in a way that's going to bring physical harm to you definitely yeah there's a great um i don't know not to get political but i'm going to reference a guy that i think uh is fantastic jordan peterson he talks about the psychological it's great he's a wizard of his own kind um he talks about that you know we have the capacity for imagination so that we can let our ideas die so that we don't have to we don't have to test everything in physical life we can run thought experiments we can run what if scenarios and say based on what i know about the world what do i believe would happen if i follow xyz course and then what's going to be the outcome so i think a lot of our dreams are exactly that they are running these what if thought experiments that incorporate questions and answers they 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 set up get them to keep returning to this idea the idea of thought experiments they set up hypothetical scenarios and then we run through them um this relates to the thing where i tell people um if you're uncertain about something go ahead and be uncertain and then literally sleep on it 
because mm-hmm. there's a good chance you whether you, you will have a dream experience, your brain will continue to process. And whether or not you remember a dream, you may wake up the next day with a resolution to that specific problem because you gave it time to process and you ran those thought experiments while you're unconscious. And you don't have to have any memory of ever having a dream. And you may have literally had a dream experience that gave you what you believe is the correct answer to a problem. So in related to um, prophetic dreams, there are dreams that are absolutely prophetic and true because they are true for you. That is actually how you feel. That is what you believe is most likely. And in the physical world, you are statistically correct. That is the most likely outcome of following a specific path. So you could look at that and say, that is a true prophetic dream if you make it a self-fulfilling prophecy. If you go ahead and act on that understanding and make it real, then it will become real. And you have had literally a prophetic dream in that in that sense. So that's one kind of prophetic dreaming I do I do believe in. <laughs> yeah, I can see that. Yeah. Um, you know, because I believe that, uh, and and a lot of other like people that follow a path like I do, or you know, Norse Norse heathens, pagans, um, believe that. Um, you know, certain things are set in this, uh, we call it a web of weird. Weird is an old English word that can kind of mean like fate, but it doesn't mean fate in the same like maybe Greek context, you know, that, that fate yeah. is set. Uh, it, it is set in the, in the to, to the extent that, you know, you were fated to be born at a specific time and you're also fated to, to expire and die at a set uh, specific time. Uh, but all the things that happen you know, in between the majority of, uh, are things that you can make happen or not make happen. You have the, that yeah. power to, to weave your own threads into the web, you know, and, and act or not act. Um, and the outcome is going to be whatever. So, you know, obviously if you touch fire, you're going to be burned. If you don't, you'll be all right. But so those, those actions is, are, are, are determined, uh, by us, you know, it's not set by some sort of like divine or, or, or otherworldly uh, power, it's it's we weave those threads, and yeah. so much of of what happens when we're not conscious, you know, in that sleep state or that dream state, I think can can act as a uh as as a has you know as an aid for us in making or not making certain decisions because, like you say, it's our truth, you know, yeah, and and if we're uh you know t- trying to decide, you know, should I choose door A or door two, <laughs> right? <laughs> well, we sleep on it and we wake up the next day after having a dream about that thing. Now we're, we've landed on something. We've landed on that decision. Now yeah. we've, we've manifested that. And that's really the wild thing about, um, I think humans, like, have you done any, or have you seen any studies of, of, uh, of, of, of dreams happening in other creatures besides humans like is that is that a thing like do animals have dreams today it does appear to be a thing i mean the classic example and it's talked about i think havelock ellis goes into it in his book world of dreams that i've uh, reproduced i wish i could tell you which number it was but it is available at uh, benjamin the dream wizard.com through the uh, books page uh he talks about the classic example of we watch a dog sleep and they bark and twitch as if they're running in oh, their yeah. sleep. So yeah. there appears to be some kind of a, like my dog is in my, this, I got a dog in my lap. You can't tell, but he is having little twitchy dreams and he'll, yeah, he'll ours bark do in too, his dream. Yeah, yeah. What is he barking at? Why would he do that? And so there's, again, there's a split opinion and I'm very heavily on the side of, yeah, of course, I think animals, we, we appear to see maybe horses seem to have some kind of no, hmm. you know, nocturnal internal experience. And we know they have, these creatures have brains. And so if, we would say any creature with a brain has the potential to sleep and experience dreams and then not so much insects or, uh, or, or anything else. And birds, dreams of birds. We, you know, I don't know that there's specific research on that, but I would, uh, my opinion, if it has a brain, it dreams, uh, mm-hmm. whether it's aware of that, it can make use of it or knows the difference between dreams and reality. That's fascinating. If we ever get, really, really get the capacity to say, communicate with dolphins, we ask them, do you dream? Mm-hmm. Oh, I want to know that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I think certain creatures have have the capacity more, more than others, just because of how their brains have developed and mm-hmm. evolved over time. Yeah, I, sure. I would, I would, I would definitely believe that. Um, recurring dreams. I was going to mm-hmm. pick your brain a little bit about that. These things that we have over our life, or, or, or you know, over our lives, that are a repeat of either the same or very similar circumstances. Some of the Some of the recurring dreams I know that become very popular, you know, flying, you know, you're flying in your dream or you're breathing underwater 
or, or stuff like that, you know, things that you're like, I'm not thinking actively at least about the opportunity that I, you know, could fly or the possibility of breathing underwater. And then, you know, on a random Thursday, you know, night, I, I, I wake up and I'm like, well, that was weird. You know, yeah. what's, what's oh, going yeah. on with, with stuff like that, that you, that so far as you've been able to learn or, or, or find out. Yeah. Through my studies, you're going to reference the books again. Um, there is a category called typical dreams and it's because they are a bunch of different types of dreams that seem ubiquitous like we all know that is a dream experience because it has happened to so many people the dream of uh, and and these typical dreams are 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 very often dreams of flying dreams of falling from a high mm. place dreams of uh, being insufficiently clothed in public or in school, right. and unprepared for a test. Uh, th those are classic erotic examples dreams of... too happen. And, yeah. you know, like that's a, that's a weird thing sometimes. Cause sometimes the people that end up in those dreams, you're like, I would never, you know, <laughs> yeah. why did I dream about well, that? And that's, <laughs> that's the other thing too. This gets to the, like, uh, how do you tell what dream imagery means? So if you have a dream and I use this example, that's, you know, one I've never had, or no one's ever told me, but I'm like a classic example. You have a dream that you stab your dog and he dies and you wake up and you're like, Oh my God, that's horrifying. Did I, mm. do I want to stab my dog? Am I a violent sociopath? Am I what's wrong with me? And the understanding of that, I would come to first and foremost is no, you woke up horrified that you had done that. You do not desire that. You didn't wake up with an erection going, that was fun. Let's do it for real. You know, yeah, right. it's, it's so that experience of it, interpreting that experience, you, you would say, well, how did you feel about it? Oh, I hated it. Okay. So this represents doing harm to someone or something you care about as much as the helpless animal under your care and how horrifying a feeling that is. And then the context around it, what is going on in your life that made you need to understand you have the capacity to inflict harm that could make you feel bad about yourself. And so you better not do that. Like warning, warning, mm -hmm. danger, Will Robinson. Here's, here's, there's something happening where you needed to represent it to yourself as doing harm to, to your most beloved companion, that kind of a thing. So that's, that's what the understanding. And there was a, we're on a different typical dreams. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um so dreams and it goes with dreams of flight teeth falling out uh, a lot of dreams oh, i hate those right you I have had those. Those? I, I, oh yeah yeah oh and then recurring and, dreams i don't want to forget that was the original topic <laughs> yeah recurring dreams but yeah like the non-typical type or or those the dreams that recur but have a have a recurring theme you know you maybe you're not in the same place but yes i've, I've had the teeth falling out dream and then you wake up yeah. and you're like paranoid about it and you, you touch know? your mouth because it felt so real like I, yeah that, it felt like i actually lost a tooth now there's one tooth falls out and there it's related to a specific behavior there's all the teeth suddenly fall out there's teeth crumble and you swallow them there's a lot of different forms these but but a lot of it it focuses around the mouth and what is the mouth it's where we ingest nutrition sometimes we ingest love the love of our mother in her brownies that can be a teeth mouth related dream it can go a lot of directions but, but then we start looking at, okay, what, what is the human mouth? It is where we smile. It is where we kiss. It is where we speak and communicate from. It is, for us, it's our primary mode of getting our point across, making a connection with another person. So a lot of times teeth, and this is where we get into the dream dictionary thing. If you look it up, it'll say teeth falling out means X. Maybe it does. Maybe it doesn't to you in this context, in this dream, based on what's going on in your life right now. So we, I get into all those specifics, kind of parse out what's most likely, but if we, but we start with those broad kind of collective unconscious themes of it is something to do with the human mouth and, 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 and the mouth being changed from its proper function. Teeth should exist. So we may chew. They are critical to pronouncing the letter T and making, making sure our F's don't come out because we have nothing but floppy lips, you know? Yeah. Um, so anyway, these are all the things I get into with that kind of stuff, but then there's also the other side of it. So there's a purely cyclical, there's a physiological, and this is true too. This is another part of parsing out. What does a dream actually mean? I got to consider, Hey, have you had dental problems lately? If you did likely you're going to dream about it. You dream all your teeth fall out because you have a cavity and an, a tooth abscess and you've got a dental appointment on Thursday. Well, there's the genesis of the dream. You're afraid it, if I don't take care of my teeth, they're all going to disappear perfectly reasonable fear, perfectly reasonable vision to have catastrophizing the worst possible result of not taking care of your teeth. So physiological stuff can make a, uh, there's classic dreams of 
Greek physicians, and so you Norse pagan, and that's your framework. Mine, I've always had a fascination with Greek mythology. I'm most familiar with those stories, so I keep going back to them. Sure. Um, the god Escalapius, and then other uh, Greek uh, healers, and and post in the post Greek era, the Roman times, Galen of, of Pergamon. Um, he was very famous, and a lot of those those healers and physicians were famous for using dreams as physical diagnostics. So if someone had a dream, and this is a classic example that is maybe apocryphal, who knows, but you dream that you are driving a, a chariot or whatever, and the horses are panting and sweating and straining and struggling to get you uphill. So this guy brought that dream to, I think it was Galen, and he said, oh, you're having heart problems your heart is struggling to pump oxygen and blood around your body. And he did. He said, you know what I do? I have palpitations and I feel wow. short of breath and all of the classics say, you know, cardiac symptoms. You can diagnose physical stuff from dreams. Now, you should, I am not a doctor. You should go see a doctor. But if your dreams are focusing on physical symptoms, it could be understood that way. Make a doctor's appointment and say, you know what? I had a dream. I was drowning. Do I have sleep apnea? Maybe you do. Maybe that's exactly what it means. Wow. So you get that tested. Yeah. Because what, what is sleep apnea is we're choking in our sleep. We stop yeah. breathing. So you would have that. Phys uh, there was a, a classic uh, story of a guy. He um, had a brief dream experience that this giant lobster like insect landed on him and attacked his hand huge. And he woke up and he had a little insect bite. He had a, a mosquito had bitten his hand and that mosquito bite translated itself into this overblown giant lobster like insectoid creature attacking his hand uh wow. so very very literally physical symptoms coming into the awareness of of a dream experience yeah i've had that happen um to my limbs if you sleep in a position where you're like your leg or your arm or something falls asleep mm -hmm. like and it falls asleep so much that you lose all feeling of it it's like it's beyond and, the and pins control, and needles you can't activate the muscles yeah yeah. So like in your dream, it's like you've 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 had this like attack or, or something physical happen. So, yeah, I can see like it's like your your mind is like, dude, wake up and fix this. Something's wrong. <laughs> yeah. And that actually might be. So if we go again, so many dichotomies and this is um, dream interpretation ends up being a lot like a differential diagnosis of a physician for physical problems. You got to rule out a lot of stuff. You got to consider things at, at different levels and then you go deeper down the most likely paths. It's a one of those, um, you know, like the, the multiverse theory, you've got, let's say you've got five different choices you can make on a given day. Well, you pick one and then there's more, and then there's more that fork off of that. So you, and then you get closer and closer to the specific outcome of a specific thing. Long story short, um, if there are, so you have to parse out first, are there physical symptoms? And then even so might the dream experience still have relevance? And sometimes yes, sometimes no. So let's go with the idea of we could very easily explain the nightmare of being able to uh, being unable to run away from something pursuing you. That is another typical type of dreams. I'm stuck. I'm moving slowly. I don't have the bodily power to run as fast as I believe I should as, as fast as I believe is necessary to escape. I'm I'm incapable of escape. So that's a, that's a dream classic nightmare experience. Uh, um, it could be that you are having a numb sensation in the legs and that is translating itself into, Hey, your body can't move as freely as you would like it to. Therefore, now you're having the experience. I can't run from a monster because my legs asleep mm -hmm. literally, but it doesn't, you know, you, you don't think, Oh no, my legs asleep. You just have that experience of being unable to control the muscles yeah. of your body. Now, if we accept that as the literal cause of that experience in the dream, that doesn't mean the experience is explained away by that cause. What your body and your mind, what, what your mind can do with those bodily sensations is say, oh no, my leg's asleep. Hey, I can't activate my muscles. This makes me feel threatened, threatened as if I couldn't run away from a monster. Now we've got it. Now we've got a stream of consciousness and connected thoughts. The experience of how you try to escape and the nature of the monster now says things that could be relevant to your worldview, to your self-understanding. When I feel vulnerable, when I feel physically incapable of, of providing for my own safety, how does that make me feel? What do I fear might happen to me if I'm in a vulnerable state? And that's where we can get those psychological dream interpretations, purely physical cause, very possibly uh, useful um, inter uh, potential for interpretation still. Um, yeah. <laughs> 
That's great. And um, yeah. what about, um, and I, you know, this is all really great. This is all like really fascinating. I think it's a, a really interesting That's topic. That's why I do that, it. That I, I can talk will... about this all the time. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, I, I often think too, like, they're probably not the same, but have you, um, have you explored the um, meditative state of mind, uh, trance uh -huh. states where you're not laying down asleep? but you've kind of detached your consciousness to a, to a degree or your, your consciousness is not, you know, your, your eyes aren't open. You're not cognitive cognizant of, of things going on around you, but you're, yeah. and you're not asleep either. And things happen in those meditative or trance like states. Is that, is the same thing happening that happens to us when we're asleep dreaming or is it a different angle of, of that? We would say there's a lot of overlap and a kind of broad categorical similarity, even if they are kind of uniquely different experiences, but there is a broad umbrella category of, we, we, might, we might call them states of mind. If we, if we go that far up, there are different, being anxious or angry is a state of mind. So uh, even as broad as that, we get down to then in some ways, altered states of mind where we're getting mm -hmm. further away from the volitional will, the, the, chosen conscious attention to something and that's where we get into and there's a whole broad category you, you mentioned most of them and i don't even know if i can remember so there's being literally asleep and dreaming that's one altered state of consciousness a state of mind or a state of being um trance hypnosis uh meditation they're all there's a broad similarity with all these things because they're moving us away from that conscious focus and I was just talking to this gal and it'll be of next week's episode or whenever this, uh, this airs episode 132. Um, she was talking about how meditation and dreaming are similar because you are choosing to step back from conscious direction of your flow of thoughts. You let thoughts come, you let them go. They just happen when they happen. And the whole purpose is to detach from that and let them be and observe them kind of dispassionately from a distance. And when we wake up from a dream the next day, we are now looking back at an experience that we are detached from in time and, and space in some ways, but also in terms of um, the raw material of, of, a, of a free flow of uh, subconscious associations that we can then examine as almost as if they happen to some someone else in some ways uh, mm -hmm. an experience we viewed like a movie uh, and mm -hmm. it's, there's other theories and, and of course this talks about like altered states of consciousness in many many of these books um, there used to be theories of a dual personality that when we were asleep the a kind of director of the subconscious takes over and shows us things that it thinks is important. And that gets into like, there's a lot of evolutions of the theory of mind. They say, well, what is the mind? How does it work? What does it appear to be? And we get into say the, um, the Freud was one of the first that started to try and nail down exactly what it is in medical terms. He says, there appears to be an id, an ego and a superego. And they're, they're in constant tension with each other. And the id would be all of our animal instincts. We need to satisfy the urge for, you know, procreation. It, that's where he got every, all dreams of sexually thought that was, but also, you know, thirst and hunger and shelter and all the animal instincts are response to fight or flight. Those are the id. It's involuntary and it works the upon primal us. layer of ourselves. Yeah. Primal, primal layer, li sort of, lizard yeah. brain. A lot of people describe it different ways, but that's, so that's the id. Then the ego is kind of our conscious self as we are thinking and, and observing ourselves self-reflection the our personal preferences aesthetic tastes our feelings about uh, the world what we our moral compass uh, conscience right or wrong it's the ego and then there's the super ego which is kind of the societal pressures that represent the authority of our parents or the um getting along with other people, uh, their boundaries and, and preferences and, and whatnot. The, so the, um, the, they're, they're in this kind of triangle of constant tension with each other. And that was one of the, one of the uh, pe people like poo poo Freud, cause they're like, uh, Oh, dreams are always about sex. Well, mm -hmm. that depends, you know, but, but then they forget he's foundational for the, for introducing the entire concept. Hey doctors, you can just sit down and talk to your patients. And sometimes that helps them feel better. 
<laughs> they were they didn't do that before. They didn't think that had any value, and he he kind of made that a thing. So the the entire genre of talking therapy and psychological counselors you go to on a weekly basis it all started with him. You know, hundred hundred some odd years ago, mm. uh, or it was taken seriously at that time. People were doing it before, but he really made it a thing. Yeah. Um, I was going somewhere else with that. Fuck, uh, I've lost Freud. Uh, uh, da, 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 damn you, sex. Freud. <laughs> right, right. Oh, it's the whole sex thing. There was a um other people have to so if you understand Freud's concept of why he believes all dreams are related to sex, he he felt like the reproductive drive was at the baseline of everything. It's the idea that species of things are innately driven to reproduce themselves, to survive in the world, and survival is a matter of you got to stay alive long enough to replicate. And that goes yep. for bacteria, it goes for dogs, it goes for humans. So he thought at the baseline of everything was this life drive, life force. And other people named it differently. There was a guy, um, I don't know if it was Henry Bergson or Henri Bergson, a um, French guy who came, I think his term was Ilan Vital, the, the life essence. Um, it, but people have conceptualized it in a different, and that's basically what Freud was talking about. But he, yeah. He brought it down sometimes too much, admittedly, to the you know, literal procreative act <laughs> in terms of, you know, do, well, you wish to sexually possess your mother. You're in competition with your father. <laughs> Not exactly. You want her affection. You want her approval. You And there is some and there's yeah. some truth to that. The idea that you do look at first and foremost, when you become aware that your mom's attention is divided, her loyalty is divided between you and your father. Now you're in competition with him and you have to settle that some way yeah you either identify with him become more like him to gain her approval what does she approve about regarding him how do i emulate that to gain approval or do i become a competitor and try and sabotage him there's a lot of um and then if you start doing having relationships with people patterns of behavior with your parents that replicate over time then you get into dysfunctional relationships as an adult so he again this all goes back mm. before he started all this conversation but people like i said they poo poo it of like oh sure everything's about sex it kind of is but not really so yeah, yeah could be just that short. could it could just be that the again those 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 primal uh feelings that you talk about that are that are just inherent yeah. in us at the very you know you go back far enough but you know bunch of bunch of uh you know humanoids trying to stay warm and, and, and feed themselves and, and not get killed, Absolutely. you know, uh, how does, how do our, how does the, the spectrum of, of human emotion in the, the, the human experience, how, how broad the spectrum is, has, has evolved over time. And now we have such things, you know, uh, psychology has, has really broken it down into very specific categories, whereas, you know, and again, not even that, that long ago, um, it was much less granular, you know, mm -hmm. there, there yeah. really wasn't a whole lot of, uh focus put on on these very specific parts of ourselves and interestingly enough like you were talking about you know id ego super ego um with with when when it comes to like altered states of consciousness when you're not you know taking your your sleep and then you enter into a dream state and you have these experiences these these like self-induced altered states of consciousness whether it be through yeah. psychoactive substances or or other sorts of things um not even that extreme. Like you can, you can achieve a uh, altered states of consciousness by just listening to music, you know, yeah, or or yeah. exactly, you know, watching a, a, a lighting a candle, uh, burning incense, you know, all these things that that have an impact on our state of consciousness and how we perceive things. Um, that's that's like an induced state, you know. So we have a bit like, more. I don't know if this. You're the expert. You, is it does it fall under the same category of what like lucid dreaming is where you oh yeah have like a control of this you're not just whatever happens happens when i fall asleep you actually kind of take control of the steering wheel and drive yeah well, um, there's a controversy with that too and i'm not sure which side to come down on it uh so okay a little history of me and and it feeds into um my understanding and my limitations i typically sleep so deeply. I don't remember my dreams. It is very rare. I remember I had a dream. It is extremely rare. I could tell you anything about it. And it is almost unheard of literally like five times in my entire life. I'm 46, seven. I don't even know how old I am, but literally there are five dreams I can remember from my entire life. I just don't have that. You would say, I don't dream. 
even though I think I do, I think everybody does the entire mm-hmm. night constantly nonstop. I just don't remember them. So that feeds my understanding or limitations of dream experience. I am not a lucid dreamer. Never have been. Um, yeah. I've had literally one of the dreams I can remember is a flying dream. Uh, but it was not like soaring with ease over the, over the trees, that kind of a thing. It was a very different experience. So I'm understanding a lot of these things conceptually based on the self-report of others. So there's, it's mostly what I'm going on. And you had an actual question there. It was, was lucid was, dreams. Yeah. Lucid dreams and, and how, or if that compares to self-induced states of altered consciousness and how we're yes. experiencing things that are really not our, our conscious experience it's a, a either trance like or or meditative or hypnotic or something yeah you know so being purely same. uh sorry uh being purely um neutral about it we have mm-hmm. another dichotomy we have lucid dreams are absolutely a thing you are having a conscious experience during the subconscious state which is this weird blending of uh, okay that's one thing the other side of it is you had a purely subconscious not controlled experience of dreaming you had control of the dream which Mm. that's possible now that's entirely discounted by the people who have lucid dreams they say that is not my experience you can you tell the difference i don't know but i'm not but i'm not here to argue that point Mm -hmm. uh, necessarily but if there is an experience so if we take it seriously you did have conscious control of your subconscious nocturnal vision if we take that seriously as, as a proposition I would say the most likely cause of that or way that that comes to be, I feel like my mic keeps falling down. I don't know. Anyway, I don't know, I'm chasing it with my face. <laughs> <laughs> um, I would say the way I think that comes to be is we are close enough. There's, there's some, I, I would say there's probably a biological or physical or psychological cause that makes a lucid dreamer capable of lucid dreaming and other people, not so much. There's something about a, the ability to blend the twilight between consciously being awake and being, you know, unconscious enough to dream and not have control that there's, there's some liminal space right on the edge where the magic of lucid dreaming is possible. And so one of the books, uh, it's book six, I believe studies in dreams by what's her name, Mary, something Forster, Mary Forster, something, geez, I can't remember. Anyway, it's a book, ABC book six. It's called studies in dreams because she was a lucid dreamer and she was, so it's studies in dreams as in studying the phenomena of dream phenomenon of dreams and her own personal quasi scientific case study of herself as a lucid dreamer experimenting with what can I do in my dream? What could I, could I program myself to have a specific kind of experience? And she, you know, as, as many lucid dreamers will tell you, will tell you they can, they can say tonight, I will dream about X, Y, Z. And it happens. They, that that's exactly the experience they have. They carry that into their dreams. Um, did you have, you're raising your hand or kind of a follow-up to that. Yeah. yeah. Um, and I don't want to like de- derail if, if there was more to it, I can come back to it, but it, it, it kind is, of goes in that. It's all one big derailing. <laughs> we're, we're, we're just rambling here and let's it is it. random yeah. and let's just let's just just ride this train wreck into the obli- into oblivion right into the horizon <laughs> um when uh when when you awake from a dream that you were invested in right it was so interesting it was so you know in, you know encapsulating whatever you people that can go back to that dream after waking up again yeah it, is that does that fall under the same kind of category of of having that like, and I don't even know, like, how do you map that out? Like, this is what you have to do to get back into that dream. Is there, is there like a guide to that or that's or... what I don't know. Yeah. No, yeah. no. I, I wish I could good news, bad news. I think that's actually a thing. I think it does happen. Um, I can't explain it. I couldn't tell you how to do it, but the self-report of people is that they have had that experience and it was uh, by conscious choice. I, I fell asleep again to try and finish the dream. And I did, wow. maybe there's some kind of act of will people can impose, which causes that to happen. Um, and maybe some people are constitutionally biologically capable and others less. So, um, Mm -hmm. I look at it like, I don't seem to remember many of my dreams at all. And I, I don't, I don't think it's possible, but I don't think I am choosing not to, I don't think there's some part of me that's in denial about the value of dreams that, or is trying to protect myself from remembering these experiences. I don't think that's happening. It is possible, but I don't well, think so. What's, what's really interesting is this is the, the, the career path. This is the, the field of expertise that you've 
<laughs> landed in and you're the one that doesn't remember all of your dreams like how ironic is that you know that is very interesting and i almost look at that as like maybe that's why i'm fascinated by dreams is i can't mm. remember i don't have as active and vivid a dream life as maybe i prefer so i'm going to study it as a phenomenon i'm kind of denied so i'm looking mm. into it uh you know the the, the there's a deep mystery because it's not an experience i can well and then and then a lot of people that wrote wrote these books they got into it because they're such vivid dreamers and they have such yeah. intense dream experiences that that's where their fascination came from. Um, I think part of this for me is not just that. I think that's, that's a very real and likely cause. Um, the other side of it is that I found, I kind of accidentally discovered I had a talent for it. And then I'm kind of leaning into the talent of like, you know, sure. if you, um, someone says, Hey, you're pretty good at basketball and you should try out for the team. And then you do, and you find out, you know, if I work at this, I get better and I'm actually pretty good. So there's a lot of that um, secondary gain, uh, not secondary gain, but primary gain of, of being, becoming competent in something where you have an innate talent. There's the dog. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. He's sleeping the whole time. Now he's getting comfy. Um, I'll tell that story really briefly. I mean, how did I discover this? I was in college for psychology. I figured someday I was going to hang out a shingle, be a private counselor and, and do that whole thing. Uh, that never ended up happening, but what I was taking a history and systems of psych class and they're like going through, I mean, psychology has its roots in Greek philosophy. It goes way back to Socrates, asking questions to find out what people think and believe, maybe challenging some beliefs that seem irrational. If we challenge irrational beliefs, do they, does the life of the person improve because now they're making better decisions? Bam. I mean, it's the roots of psychology. Okay, long story short, brings us up to Freud and Jung. And I, I got to give so much credit to those guys. We got into the part in the book where it's like, and then in the 1900s, the history of psychology, they started looking at dreams seriously. And here are these, the Freudian and the Jungian approach to dreams. And it's amazingly coincidental that I was able to take two dreams, one that I'd had several years before in my life and one that I'd had recently um, and bring them to the class. I, I wrote one or two pages on each dream, detailing it, giving my analysis specifically through the lens of what Freud would tell me about my own dream and what Jung would tell me. And the teacher gave me an A for, for, for both uh, papers saying you nailed it. You showed an understanding of how they would apply their theories to your dreams. Good job. And I could have made it all up, but at least I demonstrated with yeah, that you had an understanding of it. Yeah, yeah. That particular imagery would be viewed by these guys in this way. And I was like, uh, I mean, I really, I mean, I'm getting feedback from one teacher on, you know, a couple of papers and, uh, but that, that made me think, you know, maybe I should talk to, and so I, I, throughout my life, I've, I've had a fascination with, well, what if, what if this person told me their dreams? Could I tell them anything useful to themselves that would feel meaningful to them and would give them some benefit in their life through that understanding and the ability to put it into practice? And my talent, we might say, was repeatedly validated of people saying, that makes sense. And it made my life better. And I'm like, well, well, goddamn, <laughs> I'm doing good. I'm, I'm yeah. out here saving the world one person at a time with through their, through their nocturnal visions, you know? Uh, so yeah, about three years ago, I decided I'm going to try and make this my profession. I'm going to try and become an actual wizard of dreams, uh, a, a wise one who has by virtue of study and, and, and application and practice and, um, uh, you know, knowledge and whatnot, is able to do this for a living. So we'll see. We'll see. Uh, yeah, I'm not, uh, not quite breaking even yet. I need to sell a few more books, but that's, that's the idea. You're on the way. Yeah. Uh, I hope so. And it's, it's all these little, little things like, you know, what do they say? They say it takes 10 years to become an overnight success. Uh, I got seven, <laughs> I got seven years to go. So we're, we're still in process. <laughs> Work in progress. That's great. Mm -hmm. Do you, um, what would you say has been your most profound or impactful dream interpretation thus far? like that you've given to someone. Oh, yeah. So one of the things I enjoy the most about this experience is getting to a moment where I see the, you know, the light bulb go on with someone. I see the epiphany hit them and they're like, oh my God, that's what that means. And I get a visceral feeling, a zing mm -hmm. of like, I did it. Oh, mm -hmm. I did it again. Oh my God. Because I go into each of these terrified. I'm going to be able to give you nothing. Sorry. Thanks for trying. But for whatever, and I, this is why I lean into the idea of magic is for whatever reason, I am opening myself up to some power of the universe that it, by being willing to embrace it, chooses to flow through me and be of benefit to someone else. So I almost feel like this is not me. This is the only choice I have is whether to open myself to that 
higher yeah. power. So that if, when people say, what do you think you talk to God? He talks to me. I mean, not in a voice. I don't hear voices. I don't think I'm channeling the spirit of God, the God energy that the, I want the best for you. I'm going to do everything I can to achieve that. I open myself to it and it happens. And it's almost like, it's not even me. I, I don't want to take that kind of, you know, it's a uh, glory, glory to the most high. It wasn't even me. I tell you, well, what do they say? It's like, not my pride, but my, my, my humbleness in that way. It's like yeah. I'm supreme, supremely humble. <laughs> right. No, I can tell, you know, I mean, you're, 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 you're genuine about it. And that's uh, try it. Yeah. <laughs> one of the things that I like to see across anybody really that I, that I, that I encounter, whether it's on the podcast or in real life, you know, face to face is um genuine, the, 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 the genuineness of, of it, you know, what, why, why are you doing what you're doing? You know, cause so many, yeah. so many people that I, that I come across, especially, um, in, in this particular, I mean, it's a heathen podcast, right? So I I know people that are heathens themselves, pagans themselves. Yeah. And uh, that, you know, they, they ask questions, you know, well, what should I do for this particular thing that's happening? Or which God should I, should I invoke for, for this or that? And I'm, and I, you know, the, the thing I always come back to is, well, why do you even want to do this? You know, are you doing yeah. this because you read it in a book somewhere and that's how those people did it? Or do you have a purpose? Is it, is it purpose driven? You know, there's there's a difference I feel between intent and purpose. Like, yes, you have to have an intention, yeah. but the purpose behind it is not the same thing as as your intention. You know, be have intent true, to what you're yeah. doing, be you know, be genuine about it. But the reasons why, why are we doing what we're doing? And you had a, you know, you you, you found a purpose. You've you've kind of like you said, you've leaned into that uh, thing that you were given validation on um, at, at that at one point in time. You know, and yeah. you're like, yeah, maybe let's. Let's explore this. Let's let's go into this a bit more. And you talked about, um, you know, opening yourself up to the universe. And and that's a very uh, I don't know, like I've, I've talked to a lot of different people from a lot of different walks of life. And they I'm seeing a, a, a repeated theme that that more people are realizing the. Just how connected, not even really connected, but how much a part of the universe that we are, we're not we're not just on this earth. We are this earth, mm -hmm. you know, we're not just sailing through this oblivion of, of a universe all willy-nilly like there are patterns there are trajectories there are things that are happening to each and every one of us for a reason we there is purpose behind this seemingly chaotic mess of a of, yeah. a, of a of a world of a life and when like you say when you open ourselves up to that we we are no longer wondering about things we're like oh i, I get it i'm, I'm we're, we're putting ourselves into that flow and we're and we're allowing things that are already happening to be meaningful for us. And by doing that with other people, they're, they're seeing that too. And stuff like what you're doing and, and yeah. others, you know, they're, 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 they're putting all the pieces together. We're not, we're not feeling so disassociated anymore. We're, we're actually feeling like a part of things. For sure. Big yeah. Things. And, and going back to say, you know, Carl Jung, I mean, these were towering giants in the, in, in the field of, for, for a lot of reasons, he was in his latter years trying to figure out, okay, what's the difference between this, the experience I'm having and the experience of schizophrenics, because he's like, he, he felt like he did not fit any classic symptoms of psychosis, but how to tell the difference? What am I? So he had this experience he called synchronicity and it was, and he gives a tremendous example, which I think some of them are real and some of them were, were ex, uh, what if examples of this is how it works. But, you know, he woke up from having a dream about fish and it turns out that his cook had decided to serve fish with breakfast. And then he walks to meet a client and it turns that the, it turns out that the, you know, pub he went to, this is not the actual story, but the pub he went to had a fish for their sign. And he's like, what is going on with fish today? And then it turns out the guy serving the drinks at the bar, his name is Mr. Fishburn. What is going on with all these fish? And <laughs> right. that's like the universe things coming to, and it's hard not to look at that and go, Whoa, this is beyond random this could not yeah. happen randomly or it's like one so and, and then you start looking for okay what it you know if you're going to make sense of it if you're going to put it to some some use well then he actually say uh you know like i had a client that came in and, and she had a dream about a, a giant fish and okay so something and this is where he got his theory of the collective unconscious that people are connected or we're collected to some you connected to some universal source that and that gets into the idea of psychic powers in dreams, clairvoyance, dreams about disasters. There's uncounted numbers of those. Uh, people had dreams about the Titanic before it went down, you know, that, that mm -hmm. kind of stuff. Yeah. Um, before I forget this, you had, did ask a question. It came back to me, a favorite dream. And this also gets into the idea of recurring dreams. And I would say I had an eye-opening moment 
episode 12, the guy brought me, uh, he was a, um, uh, a military veteran who was having recurring dreams. And I'm like, okay, recurring, it's early in my career. It's episode 12. I've only done 10, 10 11 interviews before that. And my theory of dreams is, is still developing. And it turns out that from our discussion, our analysis of the dream, the dream experience came back, but it changed. Now his recurring dream had a new feature. So it, long story short, he was, the recurring dream was he goes into a house, he moves through a room, multiple rooms full of people that he's not interacting with. And he's doing it as, as if he's sweeping the house, like military mm. style, like re, mm. a rec, like a recon mission. He gets to the backyard and there are these shadow people that will not allow him to move forward. And if he tries to push past him, they beat him up. This was the original dream. And he's like, what does this mean? So we talked about it. And he said, he actually got back to me and said, I had the same dream. This time I didn't try to push past the shadow people. And we got along great. They talked to me. They, they, they mm -hmm. let me know they were looking out for me. That So there was something represented in that imagery that's like, you're not ready to move beyond this point yet. If you, if you, if you do so, it won't be good for you. Uh, so we're not going to allow it. Whatever those sh that those shadow elements of himself were saying, this is this is for your own good. We're, if we have to beat you up to stop you, we're going to do that. Yeah. Um, and so we have that, your best interest in mind. Yeah. Yeah. And if it, you know, it's and and do I believe it's you know literally shadow creatures that came into his dream from another dimension? I don't think so. I think it's just an element of of himself recognizing there's something I need to confront and understand, and I need to be in a better more psychologically healthy place before I confront this. So I'm not going to handle this until yeah. I'm ready. Fantastic. Well, okay. Long, big, big meta picture. Why was this one of my favorite, favorite dreams? It opened my eyes to the idea that the proof of whether a dream interpretation was valid in a sense is whether say a recurring dream will change its nature because my theory, again, personally developing theory, we, we, why do, why do dreams come back? Because there's a specific idea that we have not come to an understanding of or made a, a decision about. And until we do, until we settle the matter in our mind, until we say, I believe this and I'm ready to move forward, that comes back to, to, to tell us, okay, let's have a look at this again. And, and most likely it's tied to something in your life where you had another experience of that kind recently. Bam, mm. the iconic imagery of that kind of experience comes back to your mind. And now you're considering the problem again. It's, yeah, been it's a trigger. Back. Yeah, yeah, it's a trick. Literally physical, real life situation triggers mental exploration of, of the, the concept one more time. And, and these recurring dreams, they, they crystallize around the different images representing the different things, because that's the strongest representation of what the thing actually is in your mind. Yeah. And that's why you can't say seashells mean the same thing to every person because um, it might mean something to you and something different to someone else, but it is still the same image, but it means something different based on yeah. your personal experience. Yeah. No, I had a dream like that, actually. Um, well, I wouldn't say a dream like that, but mm -hmm. metaphors, right? Like the, the, it, it, like the, the shadow people in, in this uh, dream that you were just talking about, like, it's not literally shadow people, but it's the metaphor physical or the whatever representation of that thing yeah that that can become that's how his mind uh, or their mind rationalized or formulated the, the the image of of what was was actually happening and i had a dream um with my mom in it and mm -hmm. it was a like i was laying on this bed i don't know where i was that's another weird thing the yeah. the, uh, the the dreams that we're we're, we're, we're somewhere that we've never, we have no memory of ever being there. It, it's a, it's a foreign place, but yet we feel like comfortable there. You know, it's not like visiting yeah. a, a new house or a new place for the first time and you feel awkward about it. it this wasn't it. Um, but it was definitely a, a, a room with a bed and I, you know, can't say that I recognized it. Um, and it was, I was laying on the bed and it was like daylight. Um, and my mom was in the room, but she wasn't saying anything. And then all of a sudden it was almost like, you know how when you're in a theater and the lights are on and then they dim the lights for the show to start? Mm -hmm. That's that's literally how it went from bright to to to, to dim, almost dark in the room. But it was kind of like a, a a hue of of candlelight. It was it was you could see, but it wasn't pitch black. And um, 
she was just like sitting there. I was laying on the bed and she was just sitting there beside me. And she would just, you know, she was kind of like just watching, just looking at me and wouldn't say a word. And I'm like, hmm. why aren't you talking to me? Like, you got something to say? Like, I'm sitting here laying here, something to say. And she would just, there was nothing. There was no voice coming out of her. And uh, that dream always like, even to this day, I, I'm like, I think I get it, you know, because there's there's like communication uh, challenges and stuff with my definitely with my not mom. Speaking. Yeah. Yeah. And um, but just being there present, yeah. but having nothing to say, you know, it's like she'll talk to me at times or, or she has in the past. But again, that uh, the, the lights dimming, you know, like that element of things where it was bright and all of a sudden it got dark. You know, I, 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 I still like have a have a. Still haven't landed on what that could potentially mean or, or sure. represent. And this was a one-off that just stuck with you or um, a recurring pattern that comes back? Just a one-off. Dream? one-off. Just gotcha. a one-off, yeah. Fair enough. Yeah, yeah, and they mean different things. I mean, you um, must have at least subconsciously come to some resolution about it that made it not a recurring problem. You were considering something specific and formulated that as a as a process of imagery and experience to encapsulate the concept and and you were able to settle it in some way that, I mean, not settle it enough to put it to bed, but it it, it does not represent a recurrent theme of yeah. an ongoing problem that you have not resolved. So uh, that's what I think recurring dreams are, uh, of course. Um, well, this gets into, and this is great too. So you're now you're enacting in some ways the role of a guest on the show, and I, I kind of proud of myself for I found the Swiss cheese hole. Um, telling people what <laughs> I remember like what you said. Be a guest. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> So, um, okay, so two two things. We're going to get there. Uh, just brief tangent. Uh, I give a lot of credit and draw a lot of inspiration from Freud and Jung, but also a guy who's still alive today, a teacher from the University of Santa Cruz, uh, G. William, call me Bill Domhoff, a great guy. He has a, an ongoing project called the Dream Bank, where people can fill out a survey. That's dreambank.net, I believe. And you can fill out a little survey thing of, of okay, here, I'm going to tell you about my dream. Here are the discrete elements. Now, why... Why do I reference him, and why is he an influential figure on my on my dream interpretation? Bro, what what he does is he he's he's has a more quantitative approach to dreams. He wants to know how many people were in it, how many animals were in it, how many buildings or or structures of what kind, how many emotional experiences, how many auditory very experiences, granular. very much. And he's trying to build statistics. Uh, we we need this kind of research. Okay, what is what is going on here? But that. So I then I go to the meta level and I'm like, don't forget to do that. Don't forget to kind of name and account for not just the narrative, but the elements of the narrative. So this is where I go into, okay, let's name the things. You're in a bed in a room that is in a house and there's lights. The, these are all the discrete, your mother is there and there is no speaking. So this is like really, so I do those things very, kind of intuitively as we go along, but I try to also keep it in my mind. Don't leave anything out. And we get we get very granular in this type of thing. So, mm. um, granular. I said your word back to you, but I get uh, granular is a good way to put it. Of like, we go into so much detail. Like, I want to know what direction were you facing, and did mm. you move one leg first? Which side of the bed did you get off of? If you stood up, how many lights were in the room? What kind of lights were there? Was your mother dressed in a particular way? Did you have any concept of seeing yourself, or just this? Was your visual experience seeing others? as if you were looking up from the bed or were you third person watching a scene, you saw uh -huh. yourself in bed. These are all different kinds of experiences and kind of leaving them out throws off the, um, it throws off the math in some ways. Uh, but sometimes I, I would say almost always, I forget things. I leave things out. We, we, we go off on tangents and it, I'm not as structured or I don't even understand my own process. This is all intuitive. Uh, what I'm doing is working backwards from, what the hell do I do? I haven't built a process and now I'm testing it like a, like a real scientist. I'm like, here's something mm -hmm. I do intuitively. What am I actually doing? And I've come to be able to describe it a little bit better. It's a long story uh, or broad strokes. I have a three part process, which is first I shut up and listen. I got to listen to the story. I got to, I got to get it from you unfiltered, tell it like you experienced it chronological narrative style. This happened, then this happened, then that happened. And then we go back through it again for what I call a deep dive and that deep dive if we were doing, say, Jungian dream analysis, that would be weeks, weeks worth of multiple sessions per week, returning to the same dream. And so I'm trying to condense that a little wow. bit into 
up, you know, as I've said in the past, I've gone four and a half hours with one person. And that was because they had three, four, five discrete segments of a dream that were all connected to each other in sequence, but could have, could have, we could have done a whole episode on each dream. Um, yeah. Or was I going with that? The idea of being a guest on the show, I did want to say this. So I, I think there's some folks out there who are like, this is fascinating. I'd love to get an analysis, but I don't want to be on camera. And I, and I get that. Like in the very beginning, I didn't have my face on camera. I thought, who cares? It's a podcast. No one needs to see me. And then I got advice from a friend of like, you need to be on video. People want to watch something. They want to see who you are. They want to want, you know, your mannerisms. Put and a face to the name. Put a face to the name. There's all like, yeah, branding and whatnot. And there's a reason I grew out the wizard hair. You know, it's, uh, uh, it's too damn well, You're hot. rocking it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Yeah, I should. It. Oh, and I said this before. It is the return of the uh, uber poofy, super saiyan, freshly showered wizard hair. It gets frizzy. It's my Scottish roots of like, you can kind of see how frizzy yes. it is. Yes. Ooh, it's monstrous. And that's, look, look at that. Yeah. <laughs> I yep. get a kick out of it too. Mostly it's up in a ponytail because I sweat like a pig and it's hot here in Portland, Oregon. Um, but being a guest on the show, it, there are, it is preferable you're on camera. You don't have to be. We can use a fake name. I can put up a video loop and, and people hear your voice and we don't say where you're from. We don't say your real name. We talk about your dream. These, this is a promise I make to everyone. I uh, just like you did in the beginning, you said, I'm not recording right now. So we, we're just talking. Mm -hmm. We always talk before I record. I never record without permission. I never release an episode without permission. I will always edit an episode. I had a guy once request me, uh, hey, that 30 seconds where I talked about my niece because it was related to the dream. She doesn't have my I don't have her permission to put her business out there. Can we? Oh, my camera froze again. Um, I'm going to try and fix it. Two seconds. No, you're good. Yeah, you're fine. It, it, it's a thing yeah protecting people's wow. uh you know anonymity or their their uh privacy is, a, is an important thing especially yeah you're here especially <laughs> when it comes to things like you know such intimate moments of of what happens in a dream or or, or other things yeah. that can kind of trickle off into the the tributaries you know like oh For sure i remember that one thing and you start mentioning stuff and then you go back and you're like ah maybe that should have should have redacted that or it's yeah. a thing and I probably shouldn't have mentioned it was a male dreamer, but I've had like 50, 60 of them. So you're not going to be able to tell which episode it was, uh, but I took that 30 seconds out. No one ever heard it. And mm -hmm. it, it did, it didn't affect anything. I do. Okay. So that's a second. That's, that's two promises. I make people I do. You will not be surprised recorded. You will not be, you know, Jerry Springer. We're not here to embarrass anyone. Right. Uh, and the, uh, the third promise is any reason or no reason at all, 10, 20 years from now, you do not want your video on my channel. It's gone. I, I don't have people sign releases. There's just my good faith ethical promise. I will treat you like the most important part of this experience and it doesn't matter to the show it doesn't you know i'm not putting me or the show or my content or my money or whatever for i'm not making you know enough to be worried about that right now but still that's my okay now why do i do that because that's who i am that's my genuine i believe that is ethically necessary that's the ethical side of things i believe this is good therefore it is what i do no questions asked um also, it is a practical necessity because really, if you're going to be doing intensely into, you're going to open your head to someone else, you need to know you can trust them to treat you well, sure. to have your best interests at heart, or you're not going to speak freely. You're going to censor yourself. Oh no, I'm in public. I'm, mm -hmm. I don't want to be embarrassed. I don't want to admit to something that I'm not ready to, you're, you're gay and you're in the closet and you're like, I don't want to say that publicly. Well, that's what the dream was about, but you can't go there because you're censoring. And it yourself. skews the read, I guess, right? And it you just it don't skews get the interpretation. Answer. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, so that's what people need to know going in. Hey, we can go anywhere with this dream. And you can be absolutely certain no one will ever see it if you don't want them to. I have not had the experience of people refusing to allow me to release an episode. Um, That's good. But I'm serious about it. And I have made edits um, by request numerous times to say, hey, that part where I spoke about that other person, I don't like the way I said that. It doesn't really express what I what I truly feel or it's going to cause problems in a relationship. Please take it out. You know, this is, that is personal private. And I, I make the deletion. I've, I've actually edited a video together by a person said, here's the timestamps of the things I'd like removed. I put it together, sent it to that person and they gave their stamp of approval. And if they said, I changed my mind, uh, it done it goes in the garbage. Yeah. I destroy it on my computer. I don't even keep a copy. Um, so that's really noble. 
Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. I, I am not, uh, you know, don't, don't, don't applaud, just throw money. Uh, <laughs> <so> <laughs> I, uh, you know, that's just how I have to, I can't do this any other way. I can't be a grifter. I can't be a, an ex exploiter. That is not my, that's not my jam. That's well, not my yeah, bag, there's man. so <laughs> much of it out there, dude. Yeah. I mean, there's so many people, like you say, that's just, it's copy paste this, or they, they, they buy a book or they watch a few YouTube videos or they, you know, watch a movie even. I mean, I can't tell you like cosplay, uh, you know, we use the, the term LARPers in the pagan community as people oh, that yeah. just like, like to dress up and look the part, like, but are you really that thing? Even titles, you know, like you use the title, you know, the dream wizard, um, that, that is a title that can carry for some people a really, you know, that means something, you know, the title wizard, like, in, especially in some circles, you know, to have the mm. name like that, like that means something. And it, and it has, yeah. you know, uh, an obligation and responsibility that goes with it. And so, you know, I've, I've known people that will, um, I don't know, like they, 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 they buy the clothes or they, they put on the costume and, uh, you know, they, they post one or two videos and next thing you know, they're, they're calling themselves like a shaman or something. I'm like, you son of a bitch, like you have no yeah. business using, first of all, I don't, I don't really get into the self title of, 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 of people. Like if you're going to give yourself a title like that, then you're probably not it. That, those true. titles yeah. come to you from the people who recognize you as such. You know what I mean? Absolutely. Yeah. You are what you are because that's what the populace has has deemed you to be. That's how it always was. You know, the, the, the people knew who the shaman was because, well, we've seen him do his thing or her thing, right? Like, yeah, the the, 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 the those titles were were given based mm -hmm. off of what the people did or what that person did. So, you know, uh, and there are there. There's so many, you know, I. uh as as a pagan like and this isn't this isn't like an an umbrella term uh or an umbrella statement that that covers all people in paganism but i divination is is a part of my practices right mm -hmm. so i use runes for for divination but um i've been doing it for i don't know since like 2017 or so you know so i've got a few years under me like i've done enough and i've got enough uh experience in it where people recognize what i've done and and say i love your readings i love what you mm. do i love your castings right so to be called whatever you know vicky or or whatever it's like that's what has people know me as in in certain contexts you know what i mean it's not that i just picked up a, a set of runes off of amazon and got a book and like i'm a vicky now or i'm a rune reader you know it's it, and that is that is the title for the um uh behavior or the um the role vicky a rune rune caster is it related to wizard like why is vitki wizard that kind of thing there are some etymological similarities like there's a uh i forget the actual what the what the word um but warlock is another one and it has those words are 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 cognate um yeah and so and I, I think this goes to the uh, archetypal level of things of like we have yes. why and i've gone into this i have one video out there it's um I keep starting new playlists on there. So I've got, you know, my ABC series of plays, my dreamscapes, my, my, uh, what dreams may come, which is just the three minutes of a person telling their dream, nothing else. That's it. If you, and you can look at those to see, do I want to watch this episode? Am I interested in this particular mystery, this dream description? Well, I started a new channel called in, in Cantus Phylacterium, the, like the container for my words, the place I keep my words. And the second episode of that was, uh, or the first episode, I can't remember. What the hell is a dream wizard anyway? What what do I mean by that? So we have the archetype of the wizard. And why is it an old man with a long beard, walks with a staff, why did, wh speaks magic words, um, scries in a crystal ball, spends all the secretive or, or, or reclusive time in a tower studying ancient esoteric texts. All of those things have Meaning you have a long gray beard because you're old. You've been around. You've seen some things. You walk with the staff because maybe your legs don't work so good anymore. Um, the speaking of magic words, I think of as it's like psychology. Like if I can listen to you and help draw from you what you need, maybe I can find some words of wisdom or advice or framing a perspective that will have the, the transformative magic of allowing you to change something in your life you want to do better. And then the idea of that um, scrying in a crystal ball, you can see the future because you understand cause and effect. And it's not, I mean, it's, I think this is all magic, even if you can exactly explain it as 
Let me tell you, I'm an old man. I've been there. I've done that. Don't do that. You're going to screw up your life, kid. That's right. a wizard. That's a wizard. And it can be the old guy down at the, at the sausage shop who's saying, what are you doing, Mikey? Don't do that shit. Yeah. You know, and, and uh, the same thing with the study of the esoteric texts is you kind of know things that other people don't because you invest the time to study it. You've done the research and, and the, the intense thinking necessary. So you put all these things together and you got a wizard. So, but this is very important too. Like there are a lot of self titled people and i am absolutely yeah. self-titled no one came along and gave me that i chose it for branding purposes and whatnot what do i do what, what's a nice hook what's a catch for this sure i could just be ben the dream guy it's, it's not as fun as saying i'm a wizard but also i am actively working to embody the archetype in practice so sure. i would say a wizard is what a wizard does if you're doing the thing there's wizards everywhere you know and i would say if you know if a vitki is uh is is working towards those same goals by those same methods, then you're a wizard in my eyes. And I think it's ubiquitous. Uh, there's, there's more out there than, you know, if you find them and it can just be that, uh, that, that wise old uncle that, uh, you know, he doesn't got a lot to say unless you ask him, but man, if you ask him, he knows what he's talking about. Uh, yeah. That's a, that's a wizard. You might want to consult. <laughs> right. Yeah. There's definitely, um, and I think the, the operative word is, you know, you're doing the thing or those, that's, mm -hmm. you know, the operative part of it is you're not just, um, putting on a, a show it's not a facade. This isn't, yeah. this isn't a game. Like you take it seriously and it shows, right? People that take things seriously and put the time and effort into doing things of quality uh, for the right reasons, the, the works speak for themselves. There's no Hope reason so, for yeah. them to have to, you know, try to justify or, or, or make a claim that isn't, that isn't accurate, you know? Um, yeah. I'm not trying to convince anyone. If people go, uh, I've had people say this. Oh, you think you're a wizard? You're dumb. I'm like, okay, thanks. <laughs> it's fair enough. That, that's that is, your opinion. Well, yeah. You know, yeah, number one, that's just like just just your opinion, man. But also, fair <laughs> enough. Who the fuck am I? I'm just some guy who says he's a wizard. Maybe I am. Maybe I'm not. Maybe that is absolutely ridiculous. And I, I hold those two concepts in my mind at the same time. This is absolutely ridiculous. This guy thinks he's a wizard, and I I think it's hilarious. And yes, I'm absolutely serious. I think if I do it right that I'm and I'm embodying the archetype and there's the archetype of the hero, the archetype of the fool and all of these different things that we, we actually do embody. And that's getting back to the, the uh, Norse, uh, Norse stuff. Loki isn't evil. People need to understand that about the trickster gods. Uh, even if some of Thank these you, are, right. <laughs> I mean, and here's a guy folks, that's not even heathen or pagan. And he's saying it, you know, like, <laughs> It's, it isn't Marvel. He's not the bad guy. He ain't the villain. Yep. Sure, he's yep. done some things in the stories that are downright shitty, but, you know, look at when the people, context of things and see. And people, people don't why. realize Thor went hunting giants for fun. He just slaughtered a bunch of them. We might look at that like random slaughter. Really? Did you have to go that way? He hunted them for sport because he thought it was funny or whatever. So it, now that's being harsh. That's one framing of that. He Maybe he had his reasons and, and whatnot, yeah. but you can easily paint any of these guys as doing the wrong thing based on our moral framework today maybe they had a different vision of why that was necessary at the time and why it was beneficial and why you should worship that spiritual energy that enacted that kind of culling of the giants because they needed to be held back whatever but loki is he's a trickster god he is the essence of transformation and change he is the one that he is the what am i trying to say uh and you probably know better better words for it than i do but if we go to the story of balder um he is the he is the instigator. role of the, instigator, yeah. the catalyst. He's the roll of the dice that says, you know, if you're not paying attention, the potential for a bad outcome will strike you like an arrow that you're not invulnerable to. And it will happen by mischief. It will happen by accident. It will happen by a trick of fate that put you in a situation you weren't prepared for. And there's consequences. So there's there's an essence to that energy that has to be accounted for and so you get that with hermes in in the um uh in, in greek or hermes or mercury in the in greek uh, religion and every religion has a trickster god you Coy coyote and raven and tricks or pan uh pan is the kind of a trickster god of the forest and yeah. representing natural forces and they are amoral in a lot of ways they're yeah. not there to hurt anybody but they're not there to save you either they're not the hero the hero is something else it's um, the, the way that i see those types is are you know like you're saying forces in nature um within society within a within a community within a social order within social constructs there is order mm -hmm. and and outside of those social constructs there is disorder and it's mm -hmm. not for any reason other than just that's just the way it's the law of the jungle baby i mean 
It is. Yeah. The, the, you know, the C is always right. You ever watch the, the Rings of Power um, on Amazon Prime, that the Lord of the Rings, the Rings of Power series? I, I saw the first couple episodes and I saw it at a friend's house because I don't have Prime. So, um, but go ahead. Yeah. But so they there's, you know, you know, the Numenorians, right? I don't know if you're mm. into the Tolkien lore at all, but the, the, the people that live on the island of Numenor, it's an island civilization. They're surrounded by water and yeah. their people in this, you know, in the series, right? They're out on this ship and, and or they're on the shore. And one of the things that they say is the sea is always right. And if you yeah. think about it, the river is always right. The mountains are always right. The, the trees, the forest, everything. Nature is always right because, again, it's amoral. There's no... Yeah idea that it, there's no concept of let's keep order let's keep this it's just hey it is what it is and, and if you're in, in it you're going to be a part of it so when in modern times we'd look at it and say uh we we instantly understand why it is ridiculous to ask the question is gravity moral or a or immoral is it right <laughs> or wrong no it simply is it just, just exists is, right? yeah and so a lot of these in my estimation as an atheist and a, a mythologist in that way we have these conceptual understandings of primal forces. It basically, the, the more primal the force, the more powerful the God. And that's why we have gods of nature and gods of, of again, back to Greek mythology. They conceived of humans as the playthings of the gods. That's one of the classic phrases. And right. we see that in Aphrodite, goddess of love, sends her son, Eros, Cupid, down to strike you with an arrow. And here we are, humans afflicted suddenly by the passion of love. That is our physical experience, as if some external force has come upon us and moves us involuntarily. Now we can choose not to act upon it. We can say this is a like a, maybe Paris should have and we wouldn't have kicked off the, the, the Trojan War maybe that's a cautionary tale about not stealing another man's wife. And then we find Probably. parallels in Christianity. Don't covet your neighbor's wife. You're going to get another Trojan war, knock it off. Um, uh, all that kind of stuff. But there's so even you, stuff in that. And some of the uh, North stuff too, there's morality, exactly. that, yeah. moral lessons. Yeah. Well, that's why I love the whole idea of uh, the um, Aesop's fables. They very, very often feature the Greek gods. Cause this was a guy that lived um 600 years prior to the Roman Empire or the, uh, you know, we go BCE before Christian era. And he was, I think, around five to 600 years. And then his stories have survived now for 2,500 years. And they're still, and I'm carrying it forward in the next edition. I'm working on, uh, you know, a wizard's guide to, to Aesop's fables saying, you know, here are the, here's the human experience of these seemingly primal forces. We will involuntarily, involuntarily experience emotions. Um, and, so this is where gods have children as well. This is the idea of it is that we have the umbrella concept, the, the almost like you go in the, you know, the genus species phylum, that kind of thing of the tech tech uh, biological taxonomy. So let's say um, the, as I said, Aphrodite, the goddess of love has a child. That child is Eros, the one that afflicts us with this romantic feeling that we then involuntarily experience, but you get like um, the God of Mars, God of war. And then he either had, his children or they were his companions, but they were strife and discord. And it was Nike, the goddess of discord, who threw the golden apple down and told Paris to pick the gods. And he picked Aphrodite because she could reward him with Helen, make Helen love him. And then that sparked. You know, so we get these moral, cautionary moral tales that are all built on this understanding of what it what is this human experience? What are the elements of it? How does it function with us? And that's where mythology comes from, it, it, an explanatory yeah. system of the world. In some ways, it was the first attempt at science and philosophy, these, these mythological systems, sure. um, the explanatory systems for the world. And then that's not to denigrate anyone who thinks these entities are corporeal in some way, that they actually exist, like there's a physical Christian God out there and Jesus lived. Not my belief system, so I see it a little differently, but right. uh, but, but I think it has the same value, even if you don't believe it actually happened. So that's where sure. my tr tremendous respect comes from. I saw a old interview. I don't know exactly how old it was, but it was between Neil deGrasse Tyson and mm. Steve Stephen Hawking. Mm -hmm. And and Neil was interviewing uh, Hawking, asking him about, uh, and I forget exactly how the the the, the question was phrased, but it, it was on the topic of religion and uh -huh. science and. Um, anyways, uh, Hawking, Hawking responded with that, you know, um, religion is the thing that existed to explain things that they couldn't before science was discovered, before, before the study of science became yeah. a thing. So you would, again, these 
these, you know, cosmic forces or, or whatnot, things that were way bigger than us, mm -hmm. uh, you know, our, our finite concept, our finite ability to process things that were just way bigger than we could, you know, comprehend mentally. Um, religion became the thing to explain it, you know? So Absolutely. why is it thundering outside? Well, we know now from science what, what thunder is, but, you know, different civilizations have different thunder gods because, you know, well, it's, it's Thor defeating the giants and keeping, you know, Midgard safe from, mm -hmm. from the, from the invasion of the giants, right? That was the civilization creating this mythical larger than life uh, force. And, and, yeah. and now of course we have the science that explains it, but still doesn't take away from anybody that wants to believe that, you know, but the science helps kind of rationalize and explain it. So for sure, I, I yeah. like that, you know, that, that that's where religion is. And sometimes people just get too, um, you get too invested in the religiosity of it. Yeah. And then so on the scientific side, people get too invested in, well, we can't prove that materially. There is mm. no, there is no, uh, you know, dowsing rod of, 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 of uh, God detection where we can say, Oh, I'm um, look, Oh, there's Thor. He's over here. I can, you know, I'm getting a right. reading on my ghost meter or whatever. We just, you know, we don't, we don't have that. And I'd say it's not possible. So there's, no. these are debates I have with people too, where I believe there is, okay, this is way off topic, but like core fundamental, I believe there is an objective morality to the universe. Now, what that is, is less important than the concept. Cause there's a lot of people out there that think, morality is and can only be entirely subjective that's where the dichotomy comes from the disagreement I, I think it is you know um okay where was i going with that uh i think there is a reality to concepts to ideas to categories so this is where this is where i think if you ask me you know are the greek gods real or are the norse gods real Yes, I think they are in a meta there. They have a metaphysical metaphysical reality, mm -hmm. not a material reality, which is I mean, some people think they have both. But at the very least, con conceptual categories exist. They are a thing. Yeah. There's uh, wet and dry. There's night and day. These are hot and cold, yeah. hot and cold, the, 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 you know, and it's to some degree to give the relativists their due hot and cold relative to what Rel relative mm. to absolute zero or, you know, um, the heat uh, or the, uh, uh, the heart of a, a sun. Sure. We have a very narrow range of what we, but we perceive the concepts and they are the darkness, the absence of light and absolute light, the white, uh, white is the color of all the, the, the colors of the rainbow together until you together. split, yeah. split them out with the prism. And now you can see each shade on the spectrum. Um, so the idea of a, uh, a rainbow, it, it, I think the most real things are where the, physical world gives us an exemplar of the metaphysical category where they, where they intersect or overlap. And so if you have a concept, you can watch operate in practice, in human experience, in the physical world, that is a, that is a God of a very real kind. Um, and then again, uh, I don't invest belief in it. Like we should go back to worshiping the Greek gods and sacrificing lambs on an altar to, you know, mm -hmm. to Apollo the way they did. But I think we should recognize the reality of, of things that, um, what is it? There's the laws of thought. Uh, a thing is what it is. A equals a, and then, you know, a does not equal B because B is something else. B is a separate category. So you draw a circle in the sand and you put a rock in it. There is a rock in that circle. That conceptual category is physically instantiated. You take the rock out of the circle. Now there is no rock in the circle. There can be no situation where the rock is both in the circle and not in the circle at the same time. It is either in or out. The, yeah. There is a dichotomy in the physical sense. So those conceptual categories have reality that we can, instantiate in the world and this is the way i look at a lot of the mythological stuff and even the christian stuff of like what is it um a bit the biblical stories going back to jordan, jordan peterson as well he explains like uh, the story of canon abel one of my favorites that he tells and it's like be careful of becoming resentful in the world you know you're, you're becoming resentful because your sacrifices weren't acceptable to god and then that can cause you to act and act harm on other people as a concept of human behavior We've seen that a million times. We've oh, yeah. done it ourselves. We've become resentful and spiteful and wanted jealous. to jealous, jealous, and wanted to retaliate against someone that they were just more successful than us. They were just more talented. They worked a little harder, and we're just a little, you know, butthurt about it. And, mm -hmm. You know, but but if you can understand that story and that it is absolutely true, 
then you can be aware of it. Then you can say, oh my God, I'm in this story. This is me. I don't want to be that guy. And you can choose to get out of it. You can change your story. You can yeah. literally change your narrative. You can become the hero instead of the villain if you change the, your behavior. Uh, so yeah, I think, it, and then that gets the idea of what is real, what is true. There's def, definitions and words. Uh, oh yeah. But yeah, yeah. So that's why I have the, such respect for these things. I think all these concepts, when they are true, you, you should understand them and, and act accordingly. So with that, with we're talking about yeah. truth and, and, and of course, you know, finding our own truth, do dreams come true? Mm. I have a friend I know in real life who says he has experienced a prophetic dream and it was verified a week later, the exact circumstances. And I'm like, are you sure it wasn't deja vu? And he said, I know what deja vu feels like this was not that feeling. This was something else. This was, I dreamed it and now it is happening. I don't know what to do with that. I, I believe him. That's where I go with that. I say, yes, I think that was a real experience for him. Is he wrong? Possibly, but he's not lying. So if we go with that, I think there is an entire realm of stuff that is, that is real and true that I cannot explain and I cannot confirm. So yeah. I think oh, good luck telling the difference, uh, but I, but I, right. but I think it's possible. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I land, I land on it with, uh, with, with, a with a view of yes. And, and the reason why is that, you know, again, what, what's happening when we dream, right? We're still our, uh, you know, this, this subconscious, our minds never turn off. Mm -hmm. Things are still happening, even when we're not physically aware of it happening, it's happening subconsciously. Um, but we're, retaining that to those those details to some degree and it's and it's uh something that sticks out so you know it's so profound or it's so impactful that i would say that having those visions kind of lay the groundwork for the to happen like we 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 manifest Absolutely. it we manifest it out because of that subconscious experience why did it happen who's to say you know why we had that experience why we had that dream why we had that vision um, well, the fact is we had it and now we have a choice and we, we, we make that choice, uh, a reality, you know, we make that dream a reality. And some people will say, you know, well, I had this dream and they don't mean it in the sense of their, they, they fell asleep and they woke up the next day and they had this revelation of, of, of their subconscious thinking of it out. Um, they'll, they'll use the term dream as, you know, a vision you know, right. Something that they want to manifest. Yeah. Well, I think if it's, hopes, if it's that vivid hopes yeah. and aspirations, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And there's a reason those two concepts, we use the same word for both concepts. Yeah. Cause you're, oh, you maybe know. I should say why. <laughs> yeah, please. Yeah, <laughs> I, I didn't want to cut you off. Go ahead. Um, well, if you think about it in the very technical terms, we can close our eyes and imagine the success of a particular kind of project. And that is a vision of it. It is an imagination an image nation. It, it, we we image mm. it, we vision it, we we construct a, a a concept of what it looks like. That can happen, say involuntarily, in in while we're asleep. And that's there's a strong correlation with daydream. There's a one of the books I'm going to be getting around to is you know the um the psychology of daydreams because we have these kind of we uh, almost meditative reveries they used to call them. There goes the book. There's the cat. She's back. <laughs> That's She's like, I think I'll read this one. <laughs> right. She just, oh, there we go. The whole, go do, don't back your ass up to it. <laughs> um, we, in a, in a way, if we let ourselves fantasize, have a, a waking fantasy, phantasm, uh, going back to the Greeks, uh, phantasos was one of the Greek gods uh, of, of dreams, uh, children of Morpheus. We are letting ourselves imagine what it could be like. And the first step to making anything a reality is to be able to conceptualize it as a what if if i do this and we do, we do that um what am i trying to say uh we 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 do it when we i got to go to the dentist whatever we're back to the teeth thing um first we imagine uh the the process of getting to the dentist and a lot of a lot of this stuff is automatic but if we broke it down to its steps I got to put on pants. I got to get in the car. I got to drive a specific route. I got to park in the parking lot. I got to go check in with the gal. And the more specific we can get in our anticipation, the more accurate our anticipation, the more successful we're going to be in pulling it off. Exact. And a lot of this stuff happens automatically because we, we don't think about each individual step. But if you're going to do something you've never done before, 
you got to plan it out and say, this is the goal. And these are the steps I think will get me closer. And sometimes you, you find along the way that, uh, those you're going to turn off my camera, aren't you? Jesus. I love you. I love you, baby girl. <laughs> Knock it off. Um, you know, especially with things you've never done before, we need a pretty clear imag imagining of what those steps are in order to implement them. And in a lot of it, we're inventing it as we go. And then we, we, then, then the scientific side of things comes in. We try to implement it. We find out, oh boy, plans meet reality. And it's not exactly, and we adapt as we go. Yeah. But the, the more clear you can make that process, the more realistic that process, the, the, you can do amazing things. You can do things you've never done before because you put the thought in ahead of time to draw gotta have a, that vision. You got to have the vision, you got to have the game plan to get you where you're going. Yeah. And the sometimes roadmap. those, <laughs> yeah, sometimes those visions come uh, without our conscious effort, I would say. They do. That's amazing when that does happen, when you just so clearly visualize a process and you're like, that's it. Not only can I do that, but I want to do that. And I know it'll work. And then you do. And you're like, where did that come from? Why did I think that? Why do I want that? How did I know that? Ah, uh, that's magic to me. Uh, yeah. it, 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 that's why I look at it. It might as well be the muses uh, it, it was singing to me, the music of the spheres, you know, that's as conceptually accurate as anything else. I have no idea where ideas or inspiration comes from. It's almost something you can't force to happen. Um, it's just something that kind of feels like it happens to you. <laughs> yeah. It can, and it comes from everywhere. I mean, inspiration can come from anywhere and by any means and through any, through any, through any forum, yeah. uh, you know, it's, it, it's, it's organic. And that's where I think it comes back to, just how much a part of this big picture, this universe that, that, that we are, it's not just, you know, this isn't an accident. We're not just here. And I, and I was talking to this too. Uh, another guest I had on the show recently, you know, I was talking to them and I'm like, you and I are talking to each other today. You know, we met each other at a certain period of time. First of all, that's so random. If you think about it, because, you it know, is. we're, we're, we're like a one in a billion chance of uh Oop. turning now your my camera, camera shut off. off yeah oops let me <laughs> let me fix that why did the universe want that to happen who knows that was that was that was <laughs> strange i'm fixing it right now well here i'm gonna i'm gonna filibuster too for a second this brought me back to the idea of fate and the greek concept of the fates again that's my kind of my wheelhouse is understanding that it is you uh, the the fates measure the 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 length of the thread of your life when you're born and when you die and you, but there's also greek stories of negotiating with the fates, you can actually petition them to change the course of your life. You you have that. So there's this wonderful blending of some things are fated, some 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 uh, consequences or or happenings or different stuff is unavoidable, and the other stuff you got wiggle room. You can negotiate with fate. You can change your fate. There's very you know famous stories of like you know the, someone changing fate's mind about cutting their thread at a particular, mm. particular time. That is actually something we can do in the physical world. Uh, if you are headed for a cliff and you choose to turn the wheel, you will not go over the cliff. That right. is you know it's almost like uh, cause and effect. The con you, you are doomed to go over, over the cliff unless you turn the wheel. And the good news is you can. And what are you going to do? Choice is up to you. Now that's free will. Um, but the, but the, the the idea of of some consequences being inevitable, um, that's kind of what we're talking about. What, what, what I, how I would conceptualize the idea of the fates. Uh, yeah. yeah, yeah. And those again, those are there. Yeah, you, you, you're going to die. You were born. You're going to die. But I was like, I was talking to this guy, and I was, and I was really just like breaking it down like we're we're a one in a billion res the result of a one in a billion chance you know all of the or millions of sperm that that one reached the egg that became you you know what i mean like yeah. and, and 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 then out of all the years that you've been alive and existing you know you landed on on an opportunity to talk with me and not anybody else, or, or you know, obviously there are others, but again, it's just, when you think about how things happen, it's like, this ain't random, man. Like there's, there's, there's yeah. a bigger thing going on here. And and when you, when you really wrap your, your mind about around that and, and get a part of it, become a part of it. I, that's like I say, where, you know, you're talking about where the magic happens. It's in where the magic exists. Yeah. We, we might almost it. say we were fated to cross paths. Now the result yep. of that path crossing is up to us. I could have crossed paths paths with you and decided not to accept your invitation. Um, right. You could have heard of me and and decided not to reach out. But that we were going to meet at that place in that time through so much random chance that we couldn't 
plan for it. We, we mm-hmm. can't even understand the, the, the dominoes that led up to that. And then, we, so we were fated to, to have a meeting of some kind, and this is what we chose to make of it. That's, that's kind of how I, how I, you know, we're, was it like Gandalf said, uh, you know, you're not, you don't get to choose the times in which you live. You just have to decide what to do with the time you have. Oh yeah. Uh, yeah. I love that. Yeah. Quote. He's all, yeah. uh, yeah. Cause you know, I, it's, I didn't want this to happen. Um, I never wanted this to happen. I never meant for this to happen. This is not the way I wanted things to go. Yeah. Yeah. Well, so do all that. So do all who go through these things, right? So do all who live to see such times. And that's not for us to decide what we decide to do is, is what we do with the time that's given to us. That's what our decisions are. That's where we have yeah. the power. Tolkien was a wizard. You're here. That guy. <laughs> yeah, dude. Talking about wizards, man. He was just like, <laughs> we talk about uh the the power of words. And I mean, I've I've I'm not the only one that's that's noticed this or that's even said this. So I'm not, you know, taking any credit for it. But the word to spell, spelling, you yeah. know, you casting spells, like what wizards do, what you know, witches, magicians, right? Yeah. And stuff like you're out of them casting spells. The power of words, man. You know, formulating yes. letters into sentences that become paragraphs, that become dissertations, that become podcasts. This is magic, you know? Yeah, ab- no, absolutely <laughs> agree. And there's the idea we um we we say we are under a spell. And there's mm-hmm. a fantastic quote from one of my favorite stage plays. I total geek, like musicals, Into the Woods. They made a movie uh, of, of, of recently with some uh, good, it was a good version of the movie. Um, But I love the original stage play from back in the 90s. I had Bernadette Peters and a bunch of other people you'd recognize from the, if you're, if you're old like me. Um, One of the lines from this, this is Rodgers and Hammerstein. They've been around for years. Really mm-hmm. good, like Shakespeare, really good at at capturing the essence of human experience. One of the lines from the songs is careful the tale you tell that is the spell. And we think about how we frame and, and make a narrative of certain things. And especially when it comes to, and this was in the context of children, what you explain to them about how the world works is what they grow up believing, believing. about how the world works. So you, ha- you have to tell children something. This is what's right and wrong. This is what's this is how the world works, but you want to make sure you're you're casting the right spell. You're you're leaving the right impression and um, uh, giving them the best possible tools. And that is the terror and trauma of being a parent, which I'm not. And just, I don't think I can handle it. Too much anxiety. Uh, but you're responsible for as best you can giving an entirely new human a way to understand themselves and what's happening around them. Uh, yeah. And the, so these traditions are handed down like the, the, the Norse stuff and, and every other is here are the explanatory systems of our ancestors because it's necessary to have these understandings to, to you, you got to have some way of understanding the world. So yeah. my, why not this one? Uh, or then, then people change as they go along. They develop their own understanding, challenge yep. ideas and traditions and whatnot, but you got to start somewhere, you know, with yeah. some kind of explanatory system. Yeah. <laughs> Last thing I want to say, because sure. we've, we've been going on with this for a while. I told you, and four I, and a half hours is my limit. That's- <laughs> yeah, but I, uh, and this would probably be one of the longest episodes on my channel, because I don't know, it just seems to work like we we, we keep it like an hour, hour and a half. I've done a couple sure. hour long deals, but I do want to, you know, just in consideration of time and the listeners and the viewers, um, wrap it up soon. But I do want to yeah. bring up one one last thing uh, to you, and, and this goes back to, um, you know, dreams of course. So um, do you have any concept or, or have you come landed on a, a an answer when it comes to um, being visited in dreams by deceased people, by loved ones? Yeah. Um, and, and what the representation of that is, because, again, you know, they came to me in a dream. They said this thing, that or the other and, sure. and what that all means. Yeah, I've got it. This is another one of those things. Uh, yes and no. That's that's my mm-hmm. final answer. <laughs> um, that is another category of typical dream visitation of a deceased loved one or even acquaintance or an old friend. Uh, uh, it's loved deceased loved one. Um, spooky woo side. I am entirely open to the possibility that yes, whatever energy formed the the soul of them in this material world, embodied in that form that you knew maybe still exists out there somewhere and has the ability to come back and talk to us. I can't tell the difference. So what mm-hmm. I can say on my side is, well, at the very least, you had an image of that person because they mean something to you 
in this context. And I actually had a very, um, so and this is fascinating too. I'm still, I have so much to learn and I'm excited about learning. This, this is why I was like, I can do this for the rest of my life. I'm never going to run out of new things. I can tell, I, man, you're, you're passionate. I love it. <laughs> Thank you very much. And I, I just love, I love talking about it. One of the one of recent interviewees, uh, Dreamer, who came on the show, he is a um, uh, descendant, uh, you know, a, a Aboriginal Australian. And he was visited in a dream by his, um, at least I think at the time, deceased grandmother and possibly deceased mother. I, I have to refresh my memory. I think if I recall correctly, they were both dead and came to in a dream. Now, at the very least, whether it was really actually them, he needed to think about them or was inspired to think about them coming to him and watching over him in a way and checking in on him and having a spirit of playfulness about it of like Shh, he's giggling he's gonna see us he, he knows we're here um for whatever reason those and of course those were important uh, maternal uh, uh uh you know archetypal feminine role models in his life and i think anytime those things come to us we should pay attention so if you're having specific dreams some um I had another dream, a guy, his dead father came back and he was with his brother and it was uh, couched in the terms of a band of brothers fighting uh, zombies. Dad's here and I'm here and bro's here and we're all together. We're the, the esprit de corps, I called that episode. And mm. that one, it could be nothing more than, you know, I miss my dad. I miss the good times we had. I wish he was still with us. And if he was, we would have a grand adventure. And I think, you know, in, in looking back on that, there's so much more I could have said because, uh, you know, it's inexperienced at the times, et cetera. But maybe he, he needed to think of his dad and how much of his his dad was wrapped up in his mind of this kind of spirit of adventure. And that maybe the the reason for that iconography or, uh, you know, sacred imagery is if you want to honor the memory of your dad, make sure your life is an adventure. Live it, live it in a way that he would find it fun to come along with you and do that so that can be the lesson of 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 delivered by the spirit of our our deceased loved ones is here's important things that i represented that i believed that i did while i was alive and your you value them so make sure to carry that value forward in your in your actions in your understanding of the world so yeah are they good right yes and no are they do they really come yeah. to us i don't know are they valuable i extremely very yeah. very much so yeah I do find that uh, interesting how you say, you know, the, the the spirit of their of our ancestors or the spirit of those people, uh, how they manifest in our subconscious, the purpose behind it, right? To 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 continue their legacy, to be the thing that they were, and to continue that and to honor that in the, in their memory, and that that's something that that speaks very close to my heart and to a lot of people's uh, hearts who are who are pagans like me as well. That mm -hmm. follow a similar path because we we hold yeah. a very very close adoration and importance on uh, the veneration of our ancestors, and that's part of Definitely. what we do is is we live in ways that would be honoring them because we want them to see us. They do see us, like that's what we believe. We we believe mm -hmm. that they are they are physically gone, but they are not gone gone, right? And yeah. so I think having that's likely. those, yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, again, it, it's our truth, right? So, so the things that we experience, and so um, when when we have you know, like you mentioned early on in the episode, you know, we are so as as creatures, we are so our vision and our touch, right? Those mm -hmm. are the the big ones that we if we can see it and if we can feel it, then it's real. And when our loved ones pass and their physical representations are no longer here, we it's just, it's just part of the human experience. We feel that like we've lost them, that they're no longer around because we can't feel them, we can't see them. And so when they come to those, when we have those experiences in our in our sleep or in our dreams that we see them, it's like, it's super validating. You know, we're, it's like, ah, oh, they were, yeah. they, they came to me again, you know, they're really not gone after all, you know? And yeah. I think it, it can be a really powerful thing for us to, to manifest other things in our lives and do the things that we are destined to do, insert ourselves into our role in the universe that we should be doing anyway. And having that, 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 that element of the universe come to us and um, express itself in that, in that form uh, it can be the, the real, thing that 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 lights the fire to get things going that Definitely. need to get go yeah yeah it is not a, a it, it's not it's not for nothing it, it's not a worthless experience to have and you know the spirit of our ancestors is i think a very real 
thing, the spirit of, so there's the spirit of generosity. And we've in mm. modern times kind of encapsulated that as Santa Claus. So we have a c- modern cultural r- ritual of being given to keep the spirit of giving alive, the generosity. And it's a, it's a valid cons- concept. It is the world of the world of ideal forms, a la Aristotle. Uh, there is an essence of givingness out there and we can embody it in ritual and that's what we do and i think there's i think there's a tremendous and a lot of it is what is what does the ritual mean what is it meant to preserve and carry on it's so not all if we're talking um satanic ritual cult sacrifice maybe not a good ritual that i agree with maybe not a good message that i agree with so i'm not going to endorse that but they're doing the same kind of thing of their tradition in their own mm-hmm. way uh you know so you can you can parse out some traditions may, may be better than others um but even say let's say you're um just as an example your father was an alcoholic and he comes to you in a dream and that vision is meant uh, as a warning don't become like me don't follow mm-hmm. this path um, because you'll suffer the same consequences I do. Remember these consequences, uh, never forget. And so the the veneration of our answer, it, it goes with the, uh, the biblical admonition to honor your father and mother, honor the, the institution of fatherhood and motherhood as concepts, but also the, that your parents most likely were good people doing the best they could and made a whole lot of mistakes. So they're not evil necessarily. Now, some people fuck, yeah. fuck, up, fuck up really bad. And you're yeah. like, I don't like them. I can't even say I love them, but you know, I can yeah. remember the times they tried and they gave me life. And there's a, there's an honoring to be done there that you don't have to enable them if they're still alive. Like a, I know a guy who's a, another podcaster and took very recently, he discovered, Oh my God, my mom is a legit sociopath and she manipulated me and abused me in my whole life and played mental games and he cut her off and she's freaking out. Uh, maybe still like she can't control him anymore. He, he got away. So mm. she lo- probably looms large. And well, I think he's said, said as much looms large in some of his dreams of like, fear of being under that control again or or a word of warning do not re- remember what it is you hated about what she did to you and do not do that to anyone else that's kind of a lot of the lessons he, he drew from it so yeah oh, that's, that's a big fascinating you do a whole episode on each of these topics <laughs> absolutely man you know and i appreciate being able to go off into different like go down rabbit holes because we have oh, like yeah. we, we we've covered so many different things i think we've re- we, we've kept it centralized to you know the dream scope um uh, at least yeah. i like to think so but we did we touched on so many different things um and i really think that the people hopefully are gonna find some value to it and i want to as we as we you know wrap things up i just want to um give you the opportunity all of your socials and everything your site your your books I mean, all of it's going to be linked in the show notes and description. So for people listening and watching, um, if you could just briefly um, or, or as in, in great detail as you want, just show sure. or tell, tell everybody where they can find you and, and how they can support you. Yeah. So the primary thing is um, uh, watch the, you know, recorded, but but basically one take. We're doing it live dream interpretation show called Dreamscapes. Uh, and it's just, you know, YouTube slash Benjamin the Dream Wizard. Uh, I'm also at BenjaminTheDreamWizard.com. That's where you can find downloadable podcast uh, episodes. Uh, download the MP3, take it, to the, take it to the gym with you, save it on the phone, do whatever. You don't need an internet connection. You got a long drive in the mountains. Uh, take me with you. You can, um, I don't have full copies of my audio books there. Like I, I've been doing audio book versions of these on the, on the, um, that's what I'm, my, my editorial process has become. Um, I record the audio book as the final editorial pass for quality assurance to make sure that, commas in the right place the page breaks where it's supposed to uh the quote all the quotation marks are where they're supposed to be so that's what i'm doing for book uh, 17 uh, forthcoming i'm i'm uh, I'm on chapter just finished chapter 11 out of 13 and then i'll get that book published finally um a complete list of all the uh historical dream literature all all currently available uh, 16 books um at uh, the books page, Benjamin, the dream uh, I guess, slash books or whatever. But if you go to the main page, that's also the contact for, there's a contact page. Send me an email that way. Um, and uh, a list of all my socials out there. I mean, I'm on Twitter, minds, Facebook, literally, I think like two dozen social media. I'm everywhere. <laughs> it's hey. in my raccoon wounds. So that's me. <laughs> that's the best way. And then like, if you want to support my work, I always, I always take uh, just random donations. Definitely buy a book. I want to give you something of tangible value 
that is entertainment and you can hold it in your hands and say, Hey, I'm, I'm helping to support the guy that made this thing. That's actually pretty neat. Um, but you can all, always go, if you want to just become like a recurring supporter, you can go to Benjamin, the dream wizard.locals.com. We've got locals community there. Uh, they give the, I believe highest percentage of, if you kick me five bucks a month, uh, they take very little of it. I get almost the whole five bucks. So that's the way to go. It's better than Patreon. I think. And a lot of these other sources that take a lot more money from you. So um, yeah, and I'll take a dollar a month. I'll take a one-time donation of 10 bucks just because you're like, hey, this guy was pretty neat. Uh, you know, if you want me to keep doing what I'm doing, I, I do need that support. Got a shill. Got a shill and Absolutely. sell the merch. <laughs> Heck yeah, man. That's it. That's my story. Yeah. Well, Benjamin, Ben, the Dream Wizard, Davidson here on the first time for the, of the Random Heathen Ramblings podcast. But definitely be sure if 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 dream interpretations and, and things along that nature are of interest to you. Uh, check the description and show notes. Definitely support this guy. Subscribe to his channel. Follow and do all those things. You know, as I like to say at the end of every episode, um, appeal to the fickle algorithm gods. You know, do oh, the yeah. things that they so the gods of RNG. <laughs> 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 that, that, that are so just ingenuine. They're just, just greedy suckers. You know, but yes, yeah. definitely do the things. Um, and Ben, just hang around in the real quick because when I when when we sign everybody off, I'm gonna just say a few words to you offline. And it's been great. Thank you for being my guest on this episode of the Random Heathen Ramblings podcast. Um, it's been wonderful. So thank you so much. Thank you for having me. And for everybody else out here listening and watching, don't forget to like, comment, share, and subscribe to this video. Follow the podcast on whatever platform you're absorbing this on. Check the link tree link that's always annotated for all. Uh, all the ways that you can support what I do here. So until we see each other again, may the gods continue to notice you and may your ancestors smile upon you.